recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker, and welcome back this morning to my colleagues uh, for another day of debate and those who have tuned in online as well as those who are joining us uh, in the public gallery. I see uh, Marvin Bernstein, who is our Child and Youth Advocate and members of the Child and Youth Advocate Advisory Committee. Welcome uh, to the Legislature, and I see uh, someone who usually used to sit on the inside of this. Leo is here. Leo Zank is here. It's good to see Leo, my buddy. Uh, Leo's a page in here in his past life. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I want to begin by saying uh, congratulations to the organizers of Hockey Fest, which is returning to Summerside, uh, the, the great western capital, uh, June the 10th and 11th, and it's being rebranded this year uh, as uh, uh, Noah Dobson's Hockey Fest. And anyone who follows hockey, certainly many of us in this legislature know that Noah Dobson from Summerside is uh, one of the up-and-coming stars in the NHL with the New York Islanders and has become uh, an elite-level defenseman. And it's just like many other island players who have gone on to great things, hasn't forgotten where he's come from. Uh, and he signed on to be a partner in Hockey Fest, which is open to, uh, it's a street hockey tournament open for all ages, from seven and under to adult, and for all genders. Uh, and this year, the all of the money raised will go towards community connections in Summerside, which is an important uh, service organization in Summerside, and the registration's available online. I also want to say uh, that uh, it was great to see Olnaway uh, recently honor four PEI uh, organizations uh, with their annual Reconciliation Recognition Awards, uh, which is, are given to uh, create a positive and inclusive island community. Uh, among the, those recognized this year were the Charlottetown Islanders hockey team, the Summerside Western Capitals hockey team, the River Clyde pageant, and King's Playhouse in Georgetown. Uh, so congratulations to them and, and for all the way for continuing to recognize the importance of uh, positive and inclusive island. It's a big day in our house, uh, Madam Speaker, as our youngest, Cal McCallum, Michael Hempel King, is turning 16 years old. I can't believe it. Uh, uh, it's exciting. No school today. He's gone into motor vehicle to get his L. Uh, he's ready to drive. He's ready to roll. Uh, and just want to wish him a happy birthday. He's a great fellow. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor, uh, a great smile. He has a great positive outlook on life. Takes all of those traits from his mom, thankfully. And he's just a <laughs> wonderful boy. And I want to wish him a happy birthday. I also want to say, Madam Speaker, that it is Victoria Day weekend. And every time Victoria Day weekend rolls around, I want to uh, uh, wish all Islanders a, a great weekend. The weather appears to be turning, and uh, Victoria Day weekend... Uh, Queen Victoria's birthday is sometimes the unofficial beginning of the summer season. But it was a big day in Georgetown when I was a kid, <laughs> uh, Madam Speaker, and the Queen's birthday celebration always included our family and our cousins and friends packing a lunch and heading to the old Brudenell Park to celebrate the Queen's birthday. Now, we didn't know who the Queen was or what she did, but we didn't have to go to school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I joked with my sister this morning already that lunch at our place usually included a sandwich spread sandwich and I know many people in here think sandwich spread is a condiment but in the no in the household in Georgetown that I grew up in there was a staple all on its own meager as it was uh, and a miracle whip jar full of no-name tang uh, in which my mother could never really get the taste of miracle whip off the rim of the jar oh. But all wonderful memories, and uh, a couple of years ago, we tried to replicate the event uh, with our family. We had a lot of fun, and we did it, but uh, we, the Miracle Whip jar was a little too clean, Madam Speaker. So I just do want to wish all of my colleagues and all Islanders uh, a great uh, long weekend. Enjoy it if you can, and let's hope that summer, uh, the summer season is upon us, and good deliberations today in this legislature. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I do want to welcome those watching online uh, to the proceedings today, also those who are in the public gallery today. Um, um, Merv Bernstein, the Child and Youth Advocate, along with his uh, youth committee who serve as a, an, an advisory to, to him. So thank you for all the great work that you do. To Leo, former page in the House, welcome back um, here. I also want to mention that today is the last day of the uh, convocation exercise at, U, uh, at the University of Prince Edward Island. Today is uh, Science Day, and an honorary degree will be presented to um, the gainer Watson Creed from uh, Nova Scotia, much, much, much uh, deserved. Um, so, originally, yeah. May, uh, May 19th, today, is the World uh, Family Doctor Day. 
It recognizes World Family Doctor Day, so we all know that family physicians are really the backbone of health, the healthcare system um, here in Prince Edward Island and everywhere around the world. So we recognize all all the work that they, the great work that they do, and we also recognize all the supports that they need. Um, I want to extend my uh, birthday wishes to the premier son, Cal. 16 is a, a big a big day for him, so uh, hopefully I I guess that L will be one year, but I'm sure he'll he'll do fine on the road with his uh, mother's uh, coaching. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And again, uh, Monday will be Victoria Day, so uh, this is a long weekend. I wish everyone a very um, pleasant weekend, and uh, just to, I guess get the cottages open is generally what most people do this weekend, so uh, hopefully there isn't too much damage uh, caused by Fiona in the fall, and everybody can uh, get everything back to normal so we can have a, uh, an enjoyable summer. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Welcome to everybody back to the House today, and of course all those in the public gal gallery. I want to make special mention of Marv Bernstein, who's here, again, our Child and Youth Advocate and many members of the Child and Youth Advocate Advisory Committee. Welcome to you all. You play a very important role, and it's lovely to have you here today. Also, hi to Leo. Welcome back, Leo. Good to see you again. Um, I'd like to start off by passing on my personal congratulations to Jane McAdam, our new Prince Edward Island Senator. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks now since Jane was announced as the third PEI Senator. Of course, she joins Percy Down and Brian Francis in Ottawa. And one of the great um, advantages that we have as a province is that we have four Senators in a House of 105 seats. That's significant representation, and uh, our Senators do significant work. So I want to wish Jane all the best in, her, uh, in, in becoming a senator and representative of this island. We still have one seat to fill, of course, um, but I know that Jane will represent us well. She was the Auditor General for our province from 2013 to 20. I spent many hours in Jane's company and standing committee and in her office, and I know what a, a wonderful representative she will be for our island in the, this country's Senate. Uh, I also want to make mention of the Old Way Reconciliation Recogni Recognition Awards uh, that were handed out last night. We had two sports organizations and two arts organizations who were honored. The Charlottetown Islanders hockey team uh, for their work on Every Child Matters and also the Summerside Western Capitals for their work uh, on the Orange Jersey events that they have, and games that they, they had, first time they've done that. And also, the, the real effort they made, they went up to Lennox Island to meet with, uh, with indigenous leaders there. So, uh, and the two arts organizations were the King's Playhouse and the River Clyde Pageant, I think, was the, was the fourth. Um, so a really nice mix and recognition for organizations that represent so many different facets of our, our society here, of our community, really working hard to further and foster reconciliation with our indigenous friends and family here on Prince Edward Island. And finally, I, you know, we live in a bit of a bubble here on, on PEI. Well, firstly, let me wish Cam a happy birthday. I knew Cam and he was, uh, Cam, sorry, well, yes, uh, and, and I, I wish him well on his six, 16th birthday. Uh, we live in a bit of a bubble here and we imagine that everybody is absolutely um, attached to politics in the way that we are, and of course that's not the way it works. This is Friday, and, and most Friday nights I head out to Afton Hall to play darts. And it's lovely, it's a sort of complete change from everything else I do. And uh, during the election, uh, I, there was only one Friday night I could make it. So I went down to Afton to play darts, and, and one of the guys that I see every week, I mean, he's, he's known me for quite a long time, he said, Peter! I saw your picture on a, on a sign, a, 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 an election sign. He said, and I said, that's Peter from Darts. <laughs> said, and I, so I, I love that moniker. So Peter from Darts is really uh, happy to be here, happy to be able to do these community things. And, 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 and it reminds me of, of this little bubble that we live in, and, and uh, beautiful though it is. So I'm looking forward to throwing some darts. I'm terrible at it, but I'm looking forward to throwing darts tonight. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, 
uh, yeah, I'll have to get down to those uh, dart games there sometime. That's, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, gore from darts. Yes, the gore from darts, yeah. I um, just want to say hello to everybody in uh, District 14 and uh, wish everybody a happy uh, and safe uh, Victoria Day uh, long weekend or anybody watching. And uh, Mr. Sh M M M Speaker, um, May 21st is the World Day of Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. And this is from the United Nations. And I, I, I think it's important to, to remember as we do diversify that, that it's not what we say, it's how we communicate with others. That's the important thing. So uh, this weekend, take some time to, to get to know people and, and, and ask questions uh, and, and continue that dialogue. So I'd like to uh, just, just get Islanders to, to look at that. And, and it's a day of observation and, and, and work. And uh, I want to say hello to Marv and the, uh, the, the Child and Youth Advocate Committee, and, and especially uh, Rosin and uh, Chikonda Tamula. Um, uh, I, I think that you've answered the call for democracy, and, uh, and I'm really glad you're on this committee, and um, uh, your parents, Jufa and, and Sarah, would be incredibly proud. And for all the committee, um, by you being here and the work you do to help, help others is incredibly important. We hold these seats now for you, and there's no doubt that if you so choose, you can be in this area in the future because you're leaders beyond what you, what you know right now. So continued uh, great success with your committee, and uh, we look forward to you being the future leaders. Thank you. Honorable member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and that was lovely, member from Charlottetown mm -hmm. West Royalty. Um, good morning, everyone tuning in from online and um, to my colleagues and special welcome to everyone in the gallery today. Um, a special welcome to Marvin Bern Bernstein, Bernstein and his dynamic team um, and Leo. Um, having the, the Child and Youth Advisory Table in here, I think one of the hugest honors since I've been elected was playing a role in, in getting that table going as when um, we saw that COVID was really having an impact on the mental health of children and youth. I reached out to the Premier and he said, go for it. And so we, uh, with a lot of hard work behind the scenes, we got this rolling. And myself and the, and the Honourable Member of Education in early years served as the Chair and Vice Chair until we, the goal was always to let the children and youth take that over and run with it. But until we got it up and running, we were honoured to kind of hold the place until you got there. And just like we're holding these seats until you get here. So thank you for being here with us. You are a great reminder that when we make any decisions in here that impact anyone, and, and in your case, children and youth, that we have to reach out to you and ask you what do you think? What do you want? And then it's our responsibility to reflect that in our vote. Not what we think you want or what we think you need, but what you want and what you need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And welcome, welcome to everyone in the gallery and those who are watching from home. I'd like to, to start by wishing a happy heavenly birthday to my sister, Nicole Greg. She would have been 53 tomorrow. She passed of colon cancer on June 1st, 2011. And the reason I bring it up in the house today is because when she came ill, many of our conversations became more profound and one of them I recall being about making a difference in the lives of Islanders. And she also told me at one point that one day you might find yourself in government. And here I am. So uh, I'd like to wish her a uh, happy birthday, and uh, I'm sitting here today and, and many days thinking about her comments when, uh, before she passed. Uh, so uh, I know she's having a watching from somewhere, and uh, she has a grin on her face probably saying that I'm right again. A big shout out as well to my constituents in uh, beautiful District 24, Evangeline Miscouche. Un bonjour spécial à tous ceux et celles qui nous écoutent en direct à travers les médias sociaux, et aussi un merci sincère à mon équipe avec qui j'ai eu l'honneur de travailler pendant ma campagne électorale. A special shout out to my campaign team in District 24 that helped me get where I am today. I was fortunate enough to have a group of 28 individuals that helped me cross the, the finish line, which allowed me to stand here before you today as an MLA and Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, et le ministre responsable des Affaires acadiennes et francophones. A very special thank you goes out to Elise Milligan, my campaign manager, and to all my other volunteers as well. It was a lot of work, but we had many laughs and many good memories to share. And as one of my volunteers, Kelly, summed it up the very best, she said, 
I totally enjoyed the experience. I've learned so much, but what I will miss the most is all of Gilles' shen shenanigans. <laughs> Cheers to all of you and looking forward to working with all of you uh, in the very near future. I would also be remiss uh, not to acknowledge uh, the work and dedication of my predecessor in District 24, Mr. Sonny Gallant. Sonny has been representing District 24 for 16 years and has done an amazing job. I told him if I could be half the politician that he was, that I would be a very successful one. So uh, thanks again to Sonny for all the years that he's served uh, the constituents of District 24. And last but not least, uh, congratulations to you, Madam Speaker. I had the opportunity to congratulate you in this House. I have no doubt that your experience, your wisdom, and your knowledge will serve us well as you will uh, be instrumental in guiding this group in productive and worthwhile discussions in order to better serve our fellow Islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and also congratulations on your new role. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone in the gallery this morning. I would also like to welcome all those watching from District 23. Uh, I hope you enjoy your Victoria Day weekend. It is an honor to stand here in the PEI legislature today, and I first want to thank uh, the people of District 23 for showing their confidence in myself and our party. I want to thank my amazing campaign team for their hard work and their support. And finally, my family, and especially Marlene, who has been my rock all the way. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Member from uh, Charlton Winslow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's uh, always a pleasure to rise and uh, welcome everyone in here to the chamber. Uh, I don't know if uh, if the constituents of District 10 are coming in to keep checking up on me every day, but this is another day that I rise to. I recognize someone in the gallery. I'd like to uh, say hello to Donnie McLean. Donnie's here visiting from District 10, and uh, he does amazing work with the uh, Lions Club over in Stratford. So I really appreciate all the work you've done. I got had a chance to chat with Donnie there at the uh, recent uh, district convention uh, back last month. So. I just want to thank you for all that you do for Islanders as well. Thank you for coming here today, Donnie. Madam Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it's a pleasure to rise here today and welcome everyone uh, to the legislature, all our guests. Uh, I do want to say uh, what a privilege it is for me to be here, and I want to thank the people of District 13 for, for electing me to be here. I do have a couple of uh, constituents here today. Blake Doyle and John McIntyre are here. John served as my, my campaign manager in the campaign, and uh, he did a great job in shepherding us all through, along with all my other volunteers. Um, as many know, I, I've previously tried to make my way to this legislature, and uh, we tried, and uh, we tried again, we, and uh, we were successful. And I, I just want to um, echo the, the comments uh, from the members uh, uh, earlier about the young people who are here today and who may aspire to one day make it to, to the seats in this legislature. It's very inspiring uh, for us to see you here taking an interest. And there are so many ways for young leaders like you to, to serve your communities as you, as you grow up. And uh, you know, through nonprofits, uh, boards of nonprofits, community organizations, as a former city mm -hmm. councillor, and now the, uh, the minister responsible for municipal affairs, it is a wonderful opp opportunity to serve at that level of government as well, and perhaps to be here one day. Uh, you, we look to you as our future leaders, and uh, I'm very honored to have you here today, so thanks for coming. A member from Charlottetown Victoria Park would like a mulligan here, so we're going to let her get up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for indulging me. In my excitement to have the Child and Youth Advisory Table here, I totally forgot to wish a very happy birthday to my dad. So we'll be cel he celebrates on Sunday, and so he may not be watching, but if he is, I'll let him know I did this. Make him watch it. Um, so I look forward to celebrating with you on Sunday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Borden, Kincora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's one of the, uh, this weekend we're we're, uh, we're a bunch.
bunch of us are getting together, and I want to give a shout out to the Minister of Agriculture there. Uh, him and I, in the past, we, uh, his department, our department, we worked very hard on the Canada's Food Island book, which became a number one seller across Canada. So an idea for Islanders to, uh, if you want to try some great Canadian or Prince Edward Island dishes, uh, what we're going to do is we've got the eight couples together, and uh, each, each one of the couples went and picked a recipe from the book. <coughs> And uh, it's a great way to get people together and uh, try some island dishes. So on Saturday evening, there's eight couples. We're going to get together at Paul and Bethany's. And everybody's going to bring a different dish from the book. And it's something I'd, I'm actually, I wonder. Uh, I think I actually spoke about that once in this house. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a great way to get families and friends together and uh, enjoy a good book where the proceeds uh, do go to the, uh, the food banks here in Prince Edward Island and uh, enjoy some island food and uh, the camaraderie and the family ship that goes with it. So with that, have a good weekend. Honourable <laughs> <laughs> Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone in the gallery. And um, Marv uh, Bernstein, thank you very much for bringing your group of young people here today. And I look forward to one day maybe sitting down with this whole group and just uh, having a conversation and uh, getting some ideas and uh, really looking forward to that. Thank you very much for coming in. Okay, if that's everyone for greetings, I think the speaker will stand up. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here in the gallery, uh, Marvin Bernstein uh, with the Child and Youth Advocate, uh, Eric Evans, the uh, advocacy representative, uh, Marissa Mitchell, another advocacy representative, and the Child and Youth Advisory Committee members. Um, Ashlyn Goody, uh, Jolie uh, Blanchard, Samuel Ledwell McGuinness, uh, Daniel Hallett, Roslyn Tamula, Chakondi Tamula, and Ting Hao Liang. And I'll say <coughs> it's wonderful to see young people in the gallery. Um, my, uh, I share a story about myself. Uh, my dad was born in 1911, which makes it sound like I'm really old. <coughs> Uh, he started having children late in life, <laughs> let's say that. But uh, <laughs> he did, he used to say to me all the time, and he was born before women had the vote, and he used to say to me all the time, Darlene, if you work hard and you're committed and y you know what you want to do, you can succeed. And I, as long as well as the, the Honorable Premier had sandwich spread sandwiches growing up, I think we might have had real tang, Premier, so uh, maybe we were a little upscale from you, but <laughs> we did have real tang uh, once in a while. But uh, it's important that you remember remember who you are and where you come from, and that you can uh, do whatever you'd like to do in life. And I'd also like to wish Callum a happy birthday, and I'll share another little story. Seeing as it's Friday, we can share stories, but when we, we were trying to teach our son to drive, and he went out with his father, and we had a standard vehicle. It didn't go very well. So he said, Mom, will you take me out? And I said, sure, I will, sure, I will. And, he, and uh, so I'm trying to get him, you know, doing the you know, gas and the, and the clutch, and I said, Glenn, it's all about this, it's all about this. And as soon as I did that, he understood. And he still says to this day about a number of things in life, it's all about this, Mom. So uh, that's my message to everyone here in the gallery today, uh, and I hope you enjoy the proceedings. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Statements by members, starting with the a member from Moraldona. Very good lesson indeed, Madam Speaker. <laughs> uh, Madam Speaker, I want to echo uh, some of the comments from the uh, leader of the third party today. I rise today to recognize Jane McAdam on her recent appointment as Senator for Prince Edward Island. Uh, Jane, who I might mention, uh, is the, uh, the daughter of a, a World War II uh, veteran. Uh, are long time and, act, and her, Jane and her family are longtime active residents of uh, Morrell PEI. She obtained her Bachelor of Business Administration from UPEI, then received her Chartered Professional Accountant designation from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of PEI. Jane has over 40 years of experience in legislative auditing, uh, and prior to her appointments as Auditor General for PEI, she held senior positions in the Office of the Auditor General for over 25 years. Jane became Prince Edward Island's Auditor General in 2013, as we all know, and retired from the position in May of 2020. She's currently on the Board of Directors for the Canadian Audit and Accountability Foundation. Throughout her career, Jane was a member of various professional organizations and communities, including the Canadian Council of Legislative Auditors and has been active in a number of not-for-profit and community-based organizations. Her leadership and dedication to her profession 
led to her being awarded a fellow designation from the Chartered Professional Accountants of Prince Edward Island in December of 2018. Serving Islanders, Jane was responsible for leading independent audits and examinations that provide objective information, advice, and assurance to the Legislative Assembly, and we've all much appreciated it. Her, her new role as Senator will include examining and revising legislation, conducting investigations into issues of national interest, and representing our regional interests, of course. The experience and insight that Jane has gained in public policy development and implementation, finance, program and evaluation, the effectiveness of government initiatives and expenditures makes her extremely well qualified to represent our province and the Senate of Canada. I'd like to note that the Independent Advisory Board for Senate appointments recommended Jane with a merit-based arm's length process. She'll join, of course, Senator Percy Down and Senator Brian Francis as PEI's representatives in the Senate. She'll be a strong voice for Islanders and I congratulate her on this, this new accomplishment and I wish her and her husband, Peter, all the best in Ottawa. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> you can tell spring is in the air, the grass is growing, trees are budding, farmers are on the land, fishers are on the water, and it's time for the rubber ducky derby race. <laughs> I would like to recognize Rod McNeil and his great team of volunteers for this Sunday. They host the annual rubber ducky race in Time Valley. There are 2,500 ducks in total. Each have a number and people purchase a ticket, purchase a duck. The first duck over the finish line gives the ticket holder $1,000. On this day, there are lots of events for families to enjoy, including the beach goats, there's a petting, animal petting zoo, pony rides, face painting, entertainment, uh, fire trucks, golf game, and barbecue. The proceeds made from this event goes towards funding the marching bands for the Time Valley Oyster Festival Parade, which some people believe is the best one on the island. Thank you. <laughs> but the majority of the funds will go towards hosting the annual Soapbox Derby. This year's race will be held on Saturday, July 22nd, and it's the 10th anniversary of the event, and it's also held in Time Valley. The age of the racers are youth up to 14 years, and it's the largest one in the Maritimes. There are close to 100 cars in total, and the winner of the Superstock Division class gets to go to the World Championship held each year in Akron, Ohio. So, Madam Speaker, you can imagine the amount of teamwork and the cooperation it takes to pull this off. So I invite everybody, take the kids, grandkids, head to Time Valley Sunday for a day of family fun. Once again, thank you to all who took part in the organizing of this great initiative and fun-filled event. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The Honorable Mar uh, Leader of the Opposition. Please, Thank you, Madam Speaker. I started this week talking about the importance of health care. It's been a priority of Islanders, mm -hmm. and we have established this week, collectively as a House, that we've all heard this at the doors in March. Further, we have all recognized the need to foster retention and the recruitment of more health care staff. Dr. David Peachy issued a report this week citing that PEI will need to hire 2,000 healthcare workers over the next 10 years to outpace attrition and pro um, provide quality care, doctors, nurses, social workers and more. It's all a tall task. We need to focus on retention of the staff that we have now. It will be hard to attract healthcare workers if the ones we have are leaving on a continual basis. PEI needs to be the place of choice. Yesterday in this House, the Premier said, and I quote, some doctors have found it easier and more profitable to sit at home on the couch and diagnose patients than it would be to go into the office. Is this really the message you want to send? It's easy to see why some may, uh, so many complain about the toxic work environment when people at the top talk casually and throw out insults about doctors. I'm not sure if you quite understand the work ethic of those health in the health system over the past few years. Wednesday, the CEO of Health PI literally suggested healthcare workers at the Prince County Hospital were incapable of running an ICU. Patients are transferred to the QEH because, and members are in here, Madam Speaker, it's so disrespectful. They're in here laughing at this. Patients were transferred, they closed the PEI um, ICU. Patients were transferred to the QEH because those at the PCU 
did not have the skills to care for critical patients. That's what was said. Now, he walked us back, but the damage was done. And it shows the sheer disregard for those at the top, for our hardworking healthcare workers, and it hurts our overall ability to retain those in the system. The Premier and Garnham also led the charge on the ill-advised 8 million incentive program that gave bonuses for some and not for others, further breathing the toxic work environment that we have heard about in recent weeks directly from healthcare workers. Whether they know it or not, something like this creates a two-tier system amongst staff, pitting doctors against nurse practitioners, RNs against LPNs, and so on. With their comments and their actions, this government is hurting our long-term retention and at a time when we need so many healthcare workers. They need to do better. We are on a bumpy road, said the Premier. It's just the way it is, he says. It's the way it is because of your ill-advised decisions and damaging comments. And our healthcare workers deserve more. Your job is to smooth the road. It's time to get it right. Questions by members, starting with que responses to questions taken as notice. <clears throat> Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we've heard for months that health care is a top priority for Islanders. But we've seen recent research suggesting that the cost of living and affordability is a close second, and in some cases has overtaken health care as the most pressing concern for Canadians. Costs keep rising, but here in PEI, wages are not keeping up with inflation further eroding individuals and families' ability to spend and save. Question to the Minister of Workforce. What exactly are you doing to grow workers' paychecks so that island families can better keep up with inflation? Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. Um, and I can say wholeheartedly, we do care deeply about Islanders. I care deeply about Islanders in ensuring that they have affordable salaries and wages to, to move through life as, as, you know, as securely as they can. Um, and we'll continue to work hard and, and, and continue to examine that and look at that um, for future. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Thank you, Madam Speaker, but that's not really telling us what you're doing to make it, make it easier for Islanders. Madam Speaker, this government is very proud of their ability to increase the minimum wage, touting it as some sort of great success. But the fact is, at, presently, at $14.50 per hour, no one can afford to live free of fear in our current market. Question to the Minister of Economic Development. Do you think workers in your district who make minimum wage are able to make ends meet given the current cost of living and housing crisis our province is struggling to grapple with. Mm, good question. Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my department is working on various programs and uh, to help grow the economy in, in Prince Edward Island. Very proud of the work that we've been doing and the, all the investments we've been making with uh, all our businesses, organizations and individuals to be able to make sure that people uh, can grow the economy here in Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm not sure if they're not hearing the questions over there or not, but anyway, I'm going to ask, uh, continue on with another one. Madam Speaker, we know that the Islanders are struggling. Yesterday we had an, an, an entire discussion about food insecurity rates here in Prince Edward Island. And it was clear this government doesn't have a plan to address Islanders living without access to food. We know the best way to combat uh, the cost of living crisis is by putting more money in the pocket of Islanders. Question to the Minister of Finance. Will you commit here today to immediate tax relief for workers so that more of their money stays in their pockets? Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our government is committed to leaving more money in the pockets of Islanders, no question. And I think I'll leave the details of that um, for the upcoming operating budget. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You wouldn't even give us a peek, no. so we'll have to wait and we'll question when you're on the floor. So, Madam Speaker, the island's population, um, who is the island population who is impacted uh, most by growing inflation and stagnant wages, is the low-income earners and those already living in poverty. Despite knowing this, it would seem that the Department of Social Development doesn't seem to understand just how bad things are for these individuals. Question to the Minister of Social Development. Do you believe Islanders who are struggling to make ends meet deserve to live with dignity, free of the fear of how they will put food on the table or how they will pay next month's rent? Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Yes, I do. 
Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Thank you for the clear response. Mm. Um, Madam Speaker, while it was clear to hear all of these uh, ministers stand up and profess to understand and, and to sympathize, uh, sympathize with islanders who are struggling to make ends meet, their level of commitment to provide actual uh, solutions is, is less than reassuring from what we've heard. Question to the Minister of Social Development. Now, you did say yes. Do you support every islander earning a livable wage here in PEI so that no one has to live in poverty? Good question. Uh, the Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. I don't think that anyone should live in poverty, um, uh, mem or honorable member, and uh, government is committed to enhancing food security for all islanders and especially children. This government has been investing in community partners, seniors food project, community fridge, food bank, Salvation, Salvation Army, and the list goes on. So no, no one should be living in poverty. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So my question was, do you support every islander earning a livable wage here in PEI so that no one has to live in poverty? It's either yes or a no. Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Eliminating poverty again is the prov province. It requires an effort from both the province and the community. Government is certainly not just the one to handle this, and we're working together with the nonprofits and everybody that we can to eliminate poverty. Poverty. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I don't want to hear that again, so I'm going to move on. Madam Speaker, um, it's unfortunate to hear that this Minister of Social Development won't commit to eradicating poverty in our own province. So, Madam Speaker, question to the Minister of Finance. Will you? Uh, will you uh, support every islander earning the livable wage so that no one has to live in poverty? Um, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't think anyone in this government wants to see people struggle um, under that poverty line. So, um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave a lot of this language in the operating budget. You will see that we're trying to help islanders keep money in their pockets. Um, moving forward, which should aid as any help. And we're also going to be making investments um, in different areas, for sure, that will help every islander. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister of Economic uh, Development. Will you support every islander earning a livable wage so that no one has to live in poverty here on Prince Edward Island? Honourable uh, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. And um, as you know, my department is very involved in helping uh, economic growth. We have a multitude of different programs already in place, and we have been working with uh, our stakeholders and our partners and our community partners in uh, assisting them in any way, shape, or form that we could during Fiona, during different uh, scenarios that PI was facing, and uh, our our department is uh, in tune with what's happening, and we want to make sure that we support any way, shape, or form that we can. There are businesses, our organizations, and our uh, our individuals. So we are already in in that line of uh, providing auditors with great support through our loans program, through our grant program, through Invasion PEI, and we will continue to do so. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So it's getting frustrating here that they won't actually commit. To, to um, supporting this. Um, so I'm going to ask another minister, the Minister of Workforce. Will you support every islander earning a livable wage so that no one on Prince Edward Island has to live in poverty? Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you for the question, um, Madam Speaker. And to answer that, we have uh, and continued well to uh, assist with looking at the minimum wage rates and, and put increases where we can. Um, and we're continuing to look at programs to help um, transition into the labor market. We're continuing to look at ways to help islanders um, uh, work through these challenging times. And we are continuing uh, and will be committed to doing so. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's really frustrating and sad to hear so many cabinet ministers stand up here and not show the support to um, eradicating, er, um, eradicating poverty uh, by implementing a livable wage here on Prince Edward Island. So a question to the Premier. As a Premier and as a leader of our province, will you commit to eradicating poverty by introducing a livable wage for all islanders? Honourable Premier. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Leader for the question. I, I think I would reiterate much of what many of my colleagues have said, is that I think 
uh, everybody in Prince Edward Island would like to make sure we can do everything we can to make sure all islanders have the best chance uh, at, a, at a healthy and successful life, and that includes wages. Uh, there are opportunities that we've taken through uh, contracts that we've negotiated with unions on behalf of the public sector where we've continued to lift the wages. We continue to work with the private sector to increase the minimum wage. Uh, there's a delicate balance here that we have to be all mindful of, and I know the Honourable Leader of the Opposition would agree that so much of our workforce is in the private sector that we can't just automatically download things onto the private sector and in the process of doing that increase the cost of goods and services. So uh, roundabout way to say I'd like to continue to do everything we can to lift the wages for islanders across the board and it's something we all should be uh, 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 you know committed to uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Timely access to mental health services is crucial for early detection of mental illness, prevention of escalation of symptoms, and reducing risk of self-harm and enhancing overall wellness. Just last week, we learned that, uh, that the police services have been dealing with an alarming increase in mental health assistance calls. Since 2018, the volume of calls has tripled from 636 calls to 1,916 calls in 2022, just in Charlottetown. This data shows a significant gap with access to mental health supports. Question to the Premier. Aside from taking more than four years to build a facility, what is your government's plan to assist Islanders as they struggle to navigate their mental health concerns? Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think this is a very important question, a very important issue for all Islanders. Over the course of the last couple of years, we've implemented the mobile mental health units, which is, uh, uh, has been uh, improved the response times for those uh, dealing with mental health uh, challenges. Uh, we've also uh, implemented the uh, single point of call, of access call for Islanders to get into the system a little bit faster, uh, and we'll continue with those initiatives, but it's an important issue that we have to put a lot of emphasis, time, money and resources on to continue to improve. <coughs> Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The mobile mental health units experience exceptional delays upon launch. They're not open 24 hours and the single point of call is clearly not working with 19, over 1,900 calls to the, to the Charlottetown City Police. What are we doing to make sure that the police, the units, and everybody within the system are talking to each other. What is your government doing to fix this important problem? The Honourable Premier. Yeah, I do think that's an important aspect of this, is that is to continue to work with so many partners, the, the private sector, but also those in the NGO community, for example, uh, to make sure we can best utilize the resources we have for the people who need them. Uh, I would suggest that the single point of access has made it a lot easier for individuals to get into the system, uh, and I think it's something we need to continue to focus on and improve upon. Uh, but uh, I do think we're, we're, we, we need to continue to work together with all of our partners to, uh, to do a better job of making sure Islanders in need can get access to care uh, when they need it as quickly as possible. <coughs> Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Premier, for that. And, um, and staying with the, with the Premier, but just a slightly different topic, uh, Victoria Day. Um, mental health concerns are across the board, but especially I'm worried about the mental health concerns, too, with, within our main hospital. The acute care providers at the QEH are concerned with the ICU at Prince County Hospital closed and the constant shutdowns in rural ERs. Shutdowns at ERs are often felt at the main hospital within 12 to 18 hours. Already, morale is low and they are hurting. What extra resources and assets are being given to the QEH to handle the extra load while we sort out this crisis? Honorable Premier. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, uh, I would be the first to say that uh, uh, in the challenging time that we have and the decisions that have to be made based on the, the challenges in human resources, that uh, obviously any time you make a decision, uh, it has impacts. Um, operationally, I, I would probably want to just go back and talk to uh, Dr. Gardam and some of the senior executive team. Uh, uh, I've only been in the job of uh, Minister of Health for... 30 hours, so I will, uh, I, but I will come back to get that information. I think there is obviously a redeployment of resources where possible to try to alleviate some of the burdens, but, uh, uh, you know, obviously we need to do uh, more in the field of recruitment. Uh, you talked, the leader of the opposition talked about retention, and in this climate we have to realize that retention is recruitment and we have to put continued focus on that. But uh, to get back to the operational situation with QEH, picking up some of the overlap from the 
challenge to the PCH. I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can on that. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I don't know, last, uh, a few days ago, I think you, you had mentioned that you do talk to Garnham, Dr. Garnham every day before you were the Minister, Acting Minister of Health. So you should have these, and we're reacting to one of the biggest crises, as I see it, in, in Prince Edward Island's healthcare history, was shutting down over 40% of ICU beds in our province. So we don't have time anymore. We're into uh, a, a triage or an important part that, that I have to know that government has taken this seriously and, and working with this. Has your government notified other provinces to be on standby to receive more patients from PEI if the QEH becomes overwhelmed, especially as we head into the long weekend. Honorable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, and just to clarify, I talk to Dr. Gardam on a weekly basis. I, I don't speak to him daily unless uh, I, something comes up where I need to, but uh, I do meet regularly with individuals from the Health and Wellness Department along with Health PEI. Uh, yesterday I met for an hour or so with Dr. Megan Miller, who heads up our physicians, recruiting physicians. Uh, uh, department as well. So, um, uh, to date, as of 9 o'clock this morning, uh, six patients have been transferred from PCH to uh, QEH. Uh, two have been transported back, uh, and uh, we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, as we have always uh, prior to the situation uh, uh, at PCH, uh, we work with partners in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick for, for the critical cases, uh, and that continues to be the case. Uh, whether or not our senior health officials have contacted those two hospitals, I can't say for sure, but I'll double check. Uh, but uh, I think it's in the general daily course of business in treating critical care patients that they would do so, but I'll just double check to confirm that. I'm a member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just to change gears, and we talk about talk about mental health today, I'm talking about mental health within our housing continuum. Housing is a basic need, and we have long discussed in the past sitting of the legislature and agreed that housing is a human right. Our <laughs> mental health is hurting within this community. Question to the Minister of Housing. Yesterday you mentioned that transitional housing units increased. That is not quite right. The former Smith Lodge was promised in January 2020 by your government to be a 28-unit transitional housing facility. Until the very recent past, that facility only had nine beds, now an additional nine. Question to the Minister, how many more transitional units will you be creating over the next 24 months? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we do have plans to expand our trans transitional housing in the province. Um, I can say that there is uh, about 18 new beds in the works uh, and there is potential to work with some of our other partners to expand um, transitional uh, housing services. Um, so those discussions are ongoing and as I've, uh, if I said before, this is an area of our housing continuum along with many others that we'll continue to expand upon and invest in. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, you indicated that the Salvation Army is delivering transitional housing services at the former Smith Lodge. Minister, the, the contract for the Salvation Army expired in March. Minister, is there a new contract in place and will you table that contract in the legislature? Is there a new contract in place and will you table the new contract or the, the, the contract that has these new board beds attached to it in the legislature? I'm the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, I didn't say there were new beds attached to um, the Weymouth Street. Um, Smith Lodge. Smith Lodge, sorry, yes. Um, that's not what I said. Um, I wasn't aware of the contract, what, there was a new contract. I'd be happy to table that in the House. Um, there is, uh, there is, um, as I said, there's ongoing discussions about expanding our transitional beds. Some of these are, as yet unannounced. I'm not prepared to announce them here today and there's discussions about uh, expanding transitional bed services at some of our other existing partners. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Is there a contract in place currently with the Salvation Army and will you table that and is it a new contract because it expired It expired in March? Yes, Thank I'm you. sorry, uh, Madam Speaker. Sure. I'm unaware of the state of the, uh, the current state of the contract with Salvation Army for Smith Lodge and I'd be happy to get back to you with details about that. Honourable Member from O'Leary and Vaness. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Hurricane Fiona left a path of destruction when she blew through PEI in September of last year. The effects are still being felt as cleanup continues for many islanders and tourism operations, trails, rink properties are still cleaning up from uh, the devastation caused by Fiona's fury. Those in the oyster industry are among those still dealing with the damage, and this major industry is the leading exporter of oysters in eastern Canada. I've had numerous oyster growers show me the <laughs> devastating impacts of Fiona and the aftermath where new channels have been caused in the Conway Sandhills, causing extra turbidity and current, which impacts those uh, oyster cages and gear, impacting the management of these oysters. Question to the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Can these shellfish leaseholders move their leases to a more climate-friendly location that reduces the economic risks from a future storm that will be inevitable? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and that is a good question. Uh, currently, right now, the Department is working on a policy to allow for the movement of these leases um, when significant <laughs> events like such as Hurricane Fiona took place because it's out of our control. They lost a whole protective uh, sand uh, sand dune there, which has uh, caused the uh, the need for movement. We're working on the policy now. Hopefully, very soon we'll be able to come back with that policy. They're working with industry. We want to make sure that you know once you move gear, um, others are concerned as well, right? Um, so we're working on it. Hopefully, we'll have a solution very soon. <coughs> Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Prince Edward Island, like many other places, is battling hard to both attract and keep frontline medical staff. And one of the factors um, considered by healthcare workers when they choose where they want to work is the electronic medical record system that's used there. Is it efficient? Does it reduce clerical time? Is it tried and trusted in other jurisdictions? Well, it appears our province's choice of electronic medical record system is none of these things. And it's so bad that it's actually chasing doctors away. A question to the Premier. Why is PEI pursuing an untried and, by all accounts, user-unfriendly system? Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think uh, the health care system is trying to move into the 21st century and to have the electronic medical record system, which will bring efficiency to the system and will, at the end of the day, make it easier for those working in the system but also those accessing the system to have a more efficient and, uh, level of care and a system that can talk to one another. Uh, in terms of, uh, of Prince Edward Island, I know uh, change is difficult. I think uh, we've done things a certain way for a long time and when you go to implement new exercises that won't work for everybody, uh, we recognize that there have been challenges along the way here, but uh, the pathway to getting PEI onto the ele electronic medical record system is something that's long overdue uh, and we'll continue to work upon that. Honourable Leader of the Third Party for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So it's, it's hard enough to attract uh, new medical health professionals from away, but we know that even doctors with deep and long-standing roots here on Prince Edward Island are choosing to leave, and in one case primarily because of the awful EMR system that we have. To the pre and I'm going to be tabling some documents to support this in a minute. To the, team, to the Premier, what are you doing to fix this serious problem and get us an EMR system that actually works. Honourable Premier. Yeah, I think uh, I, I appreciate the question, and, and it is a challenge uh, implementing a new system because many of our physicians have done things a certain way. Some have been further advanced, some haven't been. And trying to marry all of them into one system is, without a doubt, a challenging undertaking. Uh, I, I will go back to the Health PEI senior leadership team to get a full update on where it's at and, and try to bring back a little bit more information to the honourable member. Uh, but again, as I say, trying to bring an electronic system to the province at the end of the day will make it better for uh, the patients and, 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 and the, those who serve within the health care system. And it's something that is done, uh, in, as far as I know, in every other jurisdiction in the country. Honourable Leader of the Third Party, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me be clear. I'm absolutely in favour of us installing an EMR system here. It just has to work. It has to bring us into the 21st century, and that's the problem here. It also has to work for patients, as the Premier said, but this past fall it was reported that more than 700 referrals to OBGYN were missed because 
of faults in this EMR. But there were also another thousand other missed referrals, and those have never been made public. Referrals require two steps with the system that we have. First, the family doc has to create and save a referral on the system, on the computer. And the second step is for that physician to print off the referral and fax it, fax it to the referral clinic. Talk about moving us into the 21st century, an EMR that requires a fax machine. A question to the Premier, a question to the Premier. Doctors, unions and bureaucrats have all told you about this and other serious challenges with this EMR. How and why was this system chosen and what are you doing to make it functional? Honourable Premier. Uh, again, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, some of the particulars of this I will have to get uh, go back and get some uh, further information to share with the Honourable Member. Again, the, the initiative to bring the system in Prince Edward Island under an electronic system I think is something that is long overdue and needs to be done. Uh, and uh, But as to the particulars, I would like to take that under advisement and take it back here as soon as I possibly can. Uh, the Member from Charlottetown, uh, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Two years ago, the Legislature passed the Greens Poverty Elimination Strategy Act, which commits government to reducing childhood food insecurity to 0% by 2025. When we discussed this legislation with government at the time, this was, a, we believe, to be a realistic target. But the data shows this government is moving in the wrong direction. Does the Minister of Social Development and Seniors believe her government will still eliminate childhood food insecurity by 2025? Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Madam Speaker, thank you, Honourable Member, for that uh, question. Um, eliminating, eliminating poverty in this province requires a, a province-wide effort, not just government and certainly not just one department. The 2021 Canadian Income Survey showed that PEI had a poverty rate the same as the national average of 7.4 per cent, improvement over the 13.4 per cent in 2018 and 7.6 per cent in 2020. For persons under 18 years, the poverty rate dropped from 12.5 in 2018 to 4.4 in 2021. If we are able to maintain these rates, we will have met the 2025 targets under the Poverty Elimination Strategy Act here on Prince Edward Island. So if we continue to do what we've been doing, we will eliminate the... Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> that it, that's the facts. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If we continue what we're doing, childhood food insecurity has gotten worse in the last year. If we continue what we're doing, we will never eradicate childhood food insecurity. Unfortunately, the nice words coming from over there don't solve food insecurity. Action does. The PC platform included $30,000, which is the cost of a car for a universal breakfast pot program pilot. My question to the Minister of Social Development and Seniors is, how far will $30,000 go to reduce childhood food insecurity in PEI? Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. The government is committed to enhancing food securities for all islanders and especially children. They have, we have made historic investments $40 million. Last year, the school program served 470,000 school children. This government is committed, working with community partners, seniors' food projects, community fridge, food banks, Salvation Army, and as I said earlier, the list goes on. This government is committed. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We do need to be committed from this, but we've been hearing this PC government is committed to this for the last four years, and our childhood food insecurity rates continue to get worse and worse and worse. We need action, not words. Tory times are tough times, clearly. The CBC reported yesterday evening that the school food program is in desperate need of significantly increased funding. The program is having to change ingredients to cut costs as fewer and fewer islanders are able to pay for these meals. The principal said they didn't know what we would do without this program. Will this government commit to converting our school food program into a universal free school food program? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. Yeah. Pay, pay what you can. As I said, 
Yes, it's pay what you can. This organization. The minister has the floor provided approximately 470,000 meals, as I've said time and time again. We recognize the cost of inflation has put pressure on the organization. Last year, we provided the organization approximately 3.5 million as a base budget. The Department of Social Development and Seniors has yet to present its operating budget. I believe the honorable member will be pleased to see the funding amounts allocated to the PEI school food program is in the upcoming budget. Thank you very much. I'm a member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. An issue of concern that I heard in my district when I was going door to door involved the legal activity that was being transacted in residential homes. Concerns around this were nuisance and personal safety as a result of the nearby property being active in illegal activity. I know of four such properties in my district alone, as does the police force. They do a lot to deal with it, but the process is very timely. I think of one specific house with the legal activity going on in District 21 that is a thorn in the side for a great subdivision. This house has had no power for the last nine months. They've had no utilities for the last nine months. But that never stopped people from living there. It never stopped them from running transfer trucks all hours of the evening to get supplemental power to run a light. It takes a lot of resources from our police force as they park across the street trying to curb some of it. They do regular drive-bys and whatnot. They try to do their part. Question for the Deputy Premier, Minister of Agriculture Justice, public safety and the attorney general what tools currently exist in the legislative toolbox to help law enforcement deal with this kind of situation minister of agriculture justice public safety attorney general and deputy premier thank you to the member from summerside wilmont for asking that uh tough question uh you know hard-hitting questions from the new member and uh, i can tell he cares about his uh, constituents and his neighbors uh, quite well and uh, i know we we do struggle with uh, some of these situations, and police uh, have limitations in what they can do, but we are working on safer community and uh, neighborhood legislation, which I b believe you, there might be a motion coming from the members across there on that, and it's something that uh, I uh, would love to talk to you more about. Uh, the federal legislation is limitation, limiting uh, some of our our local forces, but uh, whatever we can do to improve the safety of uh, all islanders is important to me and important to you. <laughs> Honorable member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Honorable Member, that uh, I look forward to debating that motion when we get to it. One of the concerns that the neighbors shared with me was around the situations where residents from these properties may have been having their costs covered through government support programs like income assistance. Question for the Attorney General. Is there anything in law currently that would prevent someone from engaging in illegal drug activity in a resident that is being funded and made eligible by government support? Yeah. Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. There's legislation in the criminal code uh, that's federal, um, but it's something that definitely will, will uh, we have to look at. We have to be tough on crime. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to the Joint Forces officers in your area. They do a tremendous job. The JFO in Summerside with the RCMP and the Summerside Municipal Police Force do a tremendous job. Anything we can do to support them, support the municipal forces, we will do. Thank you, Mr. Member from Summerside, Wilma, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Deputy Premier. I do agree our joint forces operations are a great asset in Summerside. Uh, another aspect of this is around public housing units, where a resident is engaging in illegal activities out of their homes. And this has also created a nuisance and fear for the public that live around them. We have heard the process to remove them can be timely, at the cost of quality of life for the residents that live around them and is having to deal with this. Question for the Minister of Housing. Are there any policies or mechanisms in place to protect residents that live around public housing from having to live with this illegal, illegal 
uh, pardon me, illegal activity next to them. Honorable Minister of Housing, yeah. Land, and thank Communities. You. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> you know, immediately upon uh, assuming responsibility for this department, we were faced with a, a specific problem I know you're referring to in your district, and uh, I know that. Um, uh, in some cases, residents uh, put up with a lot. Uh, we have to be careful to draw the line between uh, clients in our housing, uh, our public housing. We have to draw the line between what's problematic and disturbing behavior and what's illegal. And uh, I know the police were involved a lot in assessing the situation, uh, but we were eventually able to um, uh, get an emergency eviction through IRAC. Uh, I know that uh, it required a lot of patience on the part of the residents in the area, but uh, tenants have rights um, and we have to follow the law and the process. And um, in this case, I'm glad that it's finally resolved, but um, it did require some patience and following a process. Honorable Member for Mexico Emerald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, we live in an inflationary environment and costs across the board have increased significantly over the last few years. And Madam Speaker, it doesn't matter whether you're a homeowner, a tenant or a landlord, those costs have gone up. The Premier decided to, care to ignore the carefully calculated IRAC recommendations and completely eliminated any allowable rent increases this year. Not even a small in increase was allowed, even though most tenants can afford a small increase. We even heard that directly from tenants in the news recently. And government has a plethora of programs to help tenants who can't afford their rent. Instead, the decision was made to freeze rents and provide a relief program to landlords. Okay. So, for example, that 2023 uh, rental unit property tax subsidy was implemented. However, landlords are telling me this subsidy is woefully inadequate, working out to approximately 2% in most cases. Only 2%, Madam Speaker, when property taxes themselves have gone up in most cases well over 10% in the last couple of years. So, Madam Speaker, it's no wonder that we are seeing a decrease in affordable rental housing on PEI, as many landlords, especially long-time landlords, look into... Member, do you have a question? Yes, looked into low rents by rent growth, are sustaining ongoing losses with no ability to stop them, and are simply getting out of the rental housing business. It's a question to the Premier. Will you roll back and freeze property taxes for rental properties to at least 2020 levels in an effort to stop the elimination of affordable rental housing? Yeah, sure. The Honourable Premier. Oh, Madam Speaker, um, first of all, uh, we implemented a pause on a 10% <laughs> rent increase at a time when 17 or 18,000 islanders were being impacted with rising costs of food, fuel, and everything else. Uh, and uh, it was something that we needed to do. Uh, we've tried very hard to implement programs that can assist uh, those landlords, which are important uh, in the big scheme of things. Uh, no government program we would ever put through would be perfect, uh, and it was never designed to make uh, everybody uh, quote-unquote whole. Uh, we're trying to really, uh, until we implemented the, the act, we wanted to make sure that there was a level playing field for those and they didn't need to be unfairly impacted. And the rent increase across the board, as I've said many times in here, we realized that there are individuals who had been heating their apartments with oil, etc., that would need to increase the rent, but we didn't also see a need to increase rent for new properties that are already at a high level of rent, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, when they hadn't seen increases in electricity or anything else that they needed so we tried to find the, uh, the the threshold and I'm very proud that we stood here and we stopped a 10% increase in rent and uh, I'll never regret doing it. Madam Speaker. Speaker, affordable housing is what is being reduced and is taking the brunt of these policies and uh, on the other hand Madam Speaker the Premier decided to do something different for owner occupied properties and, you know, they introduced a, a property tax subsidy that eliminates owner-occupied taxes, uh, in, an increase at least, uh, by providing a subsidy to match, essentially freezing taxes, at least in the short term, for the last couple of years this has happened. In fact, this subsidy is especially frustrating to small landlords because the Real Property Assessment Act defines an owner-occupied residential property as one where a property owner did not lease or rent any part of the residential property. This means homeowners, Madam Speaker, trying to make ends meet by doing things like renting out their basement, at the same time providing much-needed affordable renting housing, don't even qualify for the property tax subsidy for owner-occupied properties. A question to the Premier. 
if you really want to provide relief to landlords, especially small landlords, why didn't you freeze rental property taxes the same way you did for owner-occupied uh, property taxes? Honourable Premier. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, that's, uh, that is a good question, and it, it, uh, I guess it really would require us to determine who would actually need to see that uh, increase. So it's hard, as I've said in here many times, and I know Hannah Bell's not here anymore, and she had always criticized me for saying it, but it's hard to implement a government policy for 100 people or for 10 people. When you implement policy, you try to find uh, the level. Uh, I realize there are individual landlords that are impacted, but I also realize there are a lot of landlords uh, that would not need to see their property taxes uh, uh, frozen, uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, all of that to say, I'll continue to look and, and explore good ideas of how we can help. Uh, all of these individuals play a role in, in the housing continuum, uh, Madam Speaker, but at the same time, we have to remember that 17 or 18,000 islanders who rent uh, didn't need to see a 10 percent increase, and that's why we, uh, we halted it. I will remember from Rusty Emerald. Madam Speaker, uh, the Real Property uh, Assessment Act ties property assessments to the All Items Consumer Price Index, the CPI which increases with inflation. In fact, many economists believe the policy to have property taxes tied to CPI actually drives inflation. They're saying it's a bad policy. Some people consider it a tax grab that increases taxes right at the same time that islanders need the help the most to lower the cost of living. And at the same time, the thresholds for programs to support people who can't afford housing aren't linked to CPI. And I know that firsthand that even as a minister, it's a real battle to get those thresholds increased. So to the Minister of Finance, I think we've got a fresh perspective over here, I hope we do. Will you change the Real Property Assessment Act to remove this inflation-driving tax grab that ties property taxes to CPI? Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am familiar somewhat on, on this, um, and um, I appreciate what you're bringing forward. And um, I think at the end of the day, um, what we all want is... Um, appropriate and attainable housing for all islanders and that's probably our goal in all of this um, so what i can tell you honorable member is i will take what you've given here today and i will bring it back and uh, bring it to the team and see what we come up with honorable member from O'Leary and Burness. thank you madam speaker just to get back and finish up our questions on shellfish <laughs> leasing uh, is the minister aware of the impact of indecision is happening thus far for these leaseholders. Does the minister understand that growers have to raise their cages then sink them every time in climate, in climate weather is forecast? Does he understand that the loss of growth and the, la and the amount of morbidity every time this occurs? So minister, when will a policy be implemented for leaseholders to move the risk of extreme weather events uh, to be able to move their leases? Will this happen in June, July? Can you be more specific? Honorable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. We were, I think there's, I know there's a couple of individuals in your area that we were ready to move, and I believe there was some pushback from uh, some others that they didn't want that to happen. So we're just trying to find the happy balance to make sure it works and that everyone uh, can come to an agreement um, when we do move these leases. We understand they have to be moved, and we hope very soon, very soon. I can't, I don't want to give an exact date, but we're working on it, and it'll be coming very soon. Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness, your final question. Minister, I remind you that the PEI Department of Fisheries has two seats on the PEI Shellfish Leasing Board. Uh, question, have you met with the, these shellfish leaseholders and have you instructed your representatives on the board to convey the urgency of this issue in developing such a policy? Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My, my, I, my, myself, I haven't met with these, these growers. Um, but I know Neil McNair has been meeting uh, regularly and, and briefing me uh, almost every couple of days on this situation because I know how important it is to them, and I know they're re really concerned, as, I, as am I. So we're hopefully going to come to a solution very soon. Um, this has never been done before where we're allowing for the complete uh, to move leases. So this is a new policy that we're developing. Um, we're working in partnership with DFO on it, who, who issues the leases on our behalf. So. I can assure you we're going to do everything we can to help these uh, these two these individuals to uh, to move their lease so that they can have a productive season. That's end of question period. We're a little bit over today, folks, but that's okay. <laughs> Statements <Yes>. by ministers. <laughs>
Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a couple of documents here that I cited in question period today. Uh, the first is part of a FOIP request regarding our electronic medical health record system. Um, and the second is an article from the Eastern Graphic by Rachel Collier, and the title of the article is Family Physician Blames Inefficient EMR Software for Departure. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that these documents now be received and do lie on the table. So, Kerry. Honourable member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a CBC story called PEI School Food Program Sees Record Growth While Trying to Tackle Rising Cross. And I move seconded by the leader of the third party that the document be now received and do lie on the table. So, Kerry. Kerry. Honourable Minister. Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action annual report for the period ending March 31st, 2022. And I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the document be now received and do lie on the table. Michelle Carey. Carey. Uh, <clears throat> reports by committees. Uh, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As a member of the Committee on Committees and following the receipt of a report on composition of the Standing Committees of the said Committee on Thursday, May the 18th, I move seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition that the report of the Committee be adopted. Michelle Carey. <clears throat> so, I'd like to speak to the motion. Uh, um, sorry, he's not done. Sorry. Honourable member from Charlottetown Winslow. Um, as a result of the deliberations, uh, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the members of the Legislative Assembly. Your committee recommends that the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges be composed of the following members. The member from Charlottetown Winslow, the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, Leader of the Third Party, the member from Kensington Malpeck, member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Your committee also recommends that the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges meet to consider the advisability of making amendments to Rule No. 90. Your committee instructs the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges to review Rule 90, Committee Membership, to consider the advisability of including non-voting permanent members to the Standing Committees and also to consider any other necessary rule changes in relation to this review. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member speaking to the report, Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I welcome the report. Thank you, Honourable Member, for that. And I want to speak uh, to one of the recommendations from this report, which is to look at Rule 90 and, and advocate for some changes in that. And I want to preface my remarks by saying that the work of committees is incredibly important. In every jurisdiction, you will see that the standing committees do extraordinarily important work on behalf of the legislature. They bring in witnesses, they do deep dives into important issues of the day and bring back reports to the legislature with recommendations. Um, for the last four years, we have had equal representation on the standing committees and it is in my mind perhaps the most welcome and progressive change that this government made to the structures and mechanisms of this House. And I'm very grateful for that. I sat on standing committees in, under the previous administration uh, between 2015 and 19, where there was not equal representation. And I can tell you that the politicization of those committees was, uh, was quite awful. And that almost disappeared when we went to equal representation on the committees. And, and it, it was, uh, I can't tell you what a value that was for the work of the committees, but also for Islanders because uh, those committees did work sort of uh, without the political lens, which was a very heavy political lens that was applied before. This change, or this change that, that is being asked for of the Rules Committee, is that we lose this equal representation. Currently, we have two members from the governing party, two members from the official opposition, and two members from the third party. 
the recommendation is to consider adding two non-voting members. Now, I understand that that will not change the balance when it comes to voting privileges on the committees. And therefore, I'm at a real loss as to understand why this change needs to be made. I want to remind the House that every single member of this legislature has many, many privileges attached to our jobs. One of those rights and privileges is that any of us can attend any standing committee meeting at any time. Any of us. So I don't understand this recommendation that we create two new permanent members, non-voting members of, a stand, of standing committees, because that right already exists. I don't understand why we're doing this. Um, I personally am going to vote against this report. Um, and I welcome arguments from anybody else in this House as to why this change makes any sense at all. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the member from Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I wanted to rise to speak this report, and thanks to, uh, to the member for, for, for bringing it to the table. Um, I also wanted to speak to uh, this potential change to, uh, to Rule 90, and I just wanted to be on the record because, uh, I mean, it's to consider the advisability of including non-voting permanent members to standing committees. And, and, and really, I think um, to make a permanent member on a standing committee that's non-voting is, is really just quite ill-advised. I think it's a front to the privilege of an MLA. I think if you're a permanent member on a committee, you deserve the right to vote. That's why we become MLAs. We, we, we are elected, at least I'm elected in this chamber, as a voice of my constituents. And I can't imagine the problems that will cause if you've got two voting members, two non-voting members. You've got to work with them. You've got to figure out, oh, are they going to vote with the way I want? my constituents' voice to be heard, or are they going to vote for their constituents, and there'll be all this wrangling that goes on, not to mention the problems that I hadn't thought of that the, uh, the leader of the third party uh, brought up. So I just wanted for the record to say that I, I am against non-voting permanent members. I agree that if you want to be a non-voting member, just go show up at the, the standing committee and partake. But if you're going to be a member, a permanent member of a standing committee, I think you should be a voting member. I, I wanted to also say that um, Back in the day, in uh, the the sitting from 2015 to 2019, I thought standing committees were very dysfunctional. It was very frustrating. Uh, they didn't meet very often. When they did, did meet, uh, the the government majority did shut down most of uh, most of the the discussion that we wanted to take place, or especially any motions of, of it with any teeth. And this really impacted the reports, and it impacted the work of the opposition. So I do agree with that. Now I think. Um, we have a lot of government members here uh, now, and uh, I think most, uh, most of us, especially on the back end, we have nine members, would like to sit on standing committees and be permanent members. Um, and maybe that's, that's where this was going, going to, with uh, having four, four people there to give more people a chance to be a permanent member of, of a committee. Now, uh, the concern would be if you have four permanent voting members from government, government backbenchers, let's say, and you have uh, four permanent, uh, permanent voting members from opposition, um, if there was an opposition MLA that was voted chair, then government would have, of course, majority, and you could end up potentially in that same situation we were back in 2015. I would like to think we wouldn't. But um, I think if we did have four voting members and uh, we had the four voting members from the opposition, if the government uh, member ended up chairing the committee, then the opposition would have the majority. And I think that would be a, a, a completely acceptable situation. I don't, and given the limited numbers in opposition, I think having government members chair, chair committees is a, a really acceptable solution. I'm not, on the, the, uh, I'm not a member on the Committee on Committees, nor am I a member of uh, Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges. So that's why I wanted to stand up today and bring this forward for the record. Um, so I think it not, would be not a bad thing to have four <laughs> government members and uh, two third-party members and two official opposition members uh, on a committee. And I, I would then leave it up to the opposition members on committee to elect uh, the chair um, from the government members in order to, uh, to maintain the majority. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the report? Honorable Mover, would you like to close debate on the report? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, yeah, so um, just so clarity for the House, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, to some of the members. The, the main reason why I had brought this forward, this uh, motion, um, when I was first elected, I came in halfway through a sitting. Um, 
And of course, as a new MLA, you want to try to get as much information as possible. You're like a sponge. You see that now with a lot of the newer members. And um, I, I, can I can remember it very clearly. The first meeting, uh, the first standing committee that I went to, um, it was a time when the committee was going to produce their or uh, work on their uh, committee report, their report back to the House here. And I remember as soon as the meeting had started, there was a motion put forward to go into camera. And at that moment, I had to leave the meeting. Okay, so I appreciate that very much. And maybe it was a misunderstanding of the rules. I was, and, and a lot of the members at that said meeting, they apparently didn't know the rules as weather as well because I did have to leave, so I got up and left. So the second part of that, I'm sorry, I don't know if I have the floor or not, Madam Speaker. I wonder you have two members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So again, that was one of the main reasons why I brought forward this uh, motion, and uh, I'm asking for members to, if they do have thoughts on it, I appreciate the leader of the third party bringing forward his comments, as well as the member from Rustico, Emerald, um, and I invite any other members in this house to speak on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All the questions. <clears throat> I'll call the question. Uh, those in favor, signify by saying yay. Yay. Those against? Nay? Nay. The report has passed. Uh, introduction of government bills. The Honorable <laughs> Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce the bill to be in titular and act to amend the Environmental Protection <coughs> Act. And I move seconded by the Honorable, uh, Transport um, Honorable Transportation, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the same be received and read at first time. Shall I carry? Bill and Carey. 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 <laughs> Bill number 12, an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act, read right the first time. An overview, honorable member. Thank you, Madam. This, uh, Madam Speaker, this bill would al allow for an increase of the fines up to five uh, or fifty thousand dollars for violations involving environmentally sensitive areas, including buffer zones and wetlands. <clears throat> um, government motions. Uh, orders of the day government, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the order number one of the day be now read. Chair Carey. Carey. Order number one, consideration <clears throat> of the speech of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, at the opening of the present session, and debate was adjourned by the Honorable Member from Rustico Emerald. Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald. Uh, well, th thank you, Madam Speaker. The podium, please. All right. So, Madam Speaker, uh, I wanted to continue where I left off yesterday, um, <clears throat> and I wanted to say that, uh, you know, I. I, I feel it's really important to uh, stand up and rep my represent my constituents and respond to the speech from the throne. Uh, what I, what I, I'm speaking to here is actually, I use the document I prepared as my input to the speech from the throne, which is actually it's a few thousand words. Um, it was information that I collected in representing my constituents over four years and in particular knocking on almost every door in the district uh, during the, the recent uh, election campaign. And, and, you know, um, there's any suggestion that I shouldn't stand and read this for the House, I find very, uh, I take it as an affront, and, and uh, I, I think that every member in, in this House, would be, be my opinion, that should stand and represent their constituents to speak to the Speaker. <laughs> so I, I wanted to, to move on to the, I, I kind of split this into the department, so this is housing, uh, land and communities I wanted to talk about next. And um, I'm just going to go down, I have a bold point list of about 14 bullets, I think, here. Um, <coughs> the first one I wanted to talk about was uh, how we can improve the, the transparency of permit applications to unincorporated communities. And uh, so right now, when someone applies for a permit to the Department of Land, um, uh, frankly, it's, it's really hard to find out what permits might be in, in the queue and, uh, you know, get a handle on, on what's going on. And in particular, as a local MLA, I think it'd be really useful to kind of know that information. So you can say, oh, I've got, you know, 23 permits for various developments 
in my district. And then you can go and talk to the developers, you can find out what's going on, you can get in touch with the local communities and make sure you understand the, which way the wind is blowing. Um, right now, it, it's not very transparent, and, and unless I'm missing something, it's really hard to find out you know, what permits might actually be on the go and what status they're at. Um, so I, I thought that'd be very useful, and this is in particular, of course, in unincorporated communities, because there is new, no municipal council there, and the local MILA is pretty much it when it comes to... Uh, to government representation uh, looking at, at, um, at permits. And of course, if we come up with a land use plan, that'll help that uh, even, even more. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, that's one of, the, one of the areas that I, I really love in the speech from the throne, this focus on a land use plan. I know the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, that's one of the things he wants to accomplish. And, and uh, I look forward to being part of, of that implementation. Um, and I wanted to say at this point that, and I mentioned this earlier, District 18 Rustico Emerald is sustaining a lot of development. Its location about halfway between Summerside and Charlottetown makes it a really desirable uh, place to live. And uh, so we're seeing uh, a lot of, uh, of new developments and uh, uh, growth of population in the area. Um, the other thing I think we can really uh, improve is the uh, public engagement that occurs during the permit application process. Uh, this is something that uh, I talked about a lot when I was in opposition. I think I even had a private member's bill on the floor to try and improve that process. Um, right now, if, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a, a person who applies for a permit, um, that permit, it's big or small, um, is actually sent out to uh, all the properties within a 100 meter distance. And Really, that doesn't engage the community <laughs> well at all. And the, pu the, the public meeting is, is also optional. It's at the discretion of the, the, the staff at land. Now, they do a pretty good job, and they have public meetings most of the time. But uh, I, I, say, I bring that up because uh, I think that's something in this mandate we should tackle, and we should improve that public yeah. engagement process. Yeah. Um, I already talked about the island-wide land use plan, which is so important. Um, one thing that was brought to me uh, by someone who has worked and has a lot of experience uh, as a CAO and working with municipal councils um, and, and planning in, in particular, creating official plans, uh, brought up that planner needs to be a regulated profession in PEI. Right now it's not. And so I, I, I think there's ramifications. First of all, if someone calls themselves a planner, there's nothing to hold them to any particular level of education or, or experience. But um, I think if it was a regulated profession in PEI, I think we would see more people perhaps getting that designation as planner. And I, I, I see there's, there's definitely members in the, the chamber here that have been councillors who are, who are agreeing that I think when you look at the, especially the larger municipalities, you need planners there and it's, they're hard to find. If it was a uh, regulated profession, more people would be pump, become planners, they would have the expertise, they'd have the education and they could be useful in municipalities as well as at the provincial level. Uh, we have a, an extreme shortage of planners at the provincial level right now. It's been a problem for at least six years, in my experience, probably more. So hopefully the new, the new minister can make some progress mm -hmm. in, in hiring some more planners in. I know, uh, I mean, recently, I, I just, I, in the last two weeks, I had two constituents who said, look, I'm ready to go on my project, I'm waiting for approval, and it has to do with, with planning and uh, land use plans, and I, I want to thank, uh, I, I want, oh, great, great, and I wanted to thank uh, the, the Minister of, of Housing and, and his team for, for acting on those and making sure that they, they were approved in a timely fashion. So, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, and I brought this up before, um, and it's something that's been known again for a long time, years and years within the department, but I want to make sure that we focus on this because we have new members in the House. Um, right now, the regulations that govern garden suites, so these are secondary buildings on a property, on a single property ID, they only allow for the parents of the property owner to live in a garden suite, believe it or not. That's in the law, it's in the regulations. <coughs> it's something an executive council can change. You don't need to come back to the Florida legislature here. Let's change the regulations so that, you know, if the parents want their children to live in the garden suite, that's allowed as well, for example. It would be a simple way to take a bite into our, our housing situation. I mean, it's, it's something, again, I've been asking for this for years. I mean, I was part of government, I asked for it when I was part of government, and I just, I think there's, 
and then the Minister of, of Land can probably attest to this, I think there's probably a queue of uh, you know, 90 to 100 regulatory changes that have, are queued up in this department. And I really don't know what's taking so long to work through them. Maybe there's a staff shortage, but please, please tackle those. This is just one of many. And, um, another one that um, I believe this would be more on the, the transportation side possibly, but it's related to, to land development, is uh, right now, if you have a property and you have a driveway that access, accesses that property, um, if you decide you want to, to build 23 cottages on that property and you get approved for the change of youth, use, you can use that single property, that single driveway, pardon me, to access all 23 cottages in your home that's on the property. No problem at all. But if you want to, say, create a permanent home on that same property, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, your, your sister says, uh, you know, I w I'd like to do uh, section off an acre and, and um, I want to build a house next door to you and I want to share your driveway. That's not allowed. The regulations don't allow that. And I can, it happens all the time out in my district where people want to develop their properties and typically it's family members who want to live next to them and they can't because they have to create a new driveway to the road, which is very expensive. And not only that, a lot of times the, the new driveway access is disallowed because of the lines of sight and, these, and they say it's not safe. So it's a real barrier, again, to, to you know, really good development where families are living next to families, helping each other. <laughs> I, I asked questions on this in the past, but I just want to make sure that that's addressed. And it, and it causes real problems as well. So. Um, one thing that uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what the, the new Minister of Housing does is, is looking at the co-op housing models that are available. Um, I talked to some constituents on the campaign trail who um, they said, you know, back in the 70s, when we were a young couple, they said, we were part of a co-op housing project. And I said, oh, really, did you have multiple, you know, couples that were or people that were living in, you know, uh, a multi-unit building and sharing, you know, living spaces. On they said, no, no, no. We each we had six couples. Each couple built their own single-family dwelling, and um, we helped each other do the builds. And and we, with that shared expertise and shared labor, we were able to keep the costs down, and we were able to to have a, a cooperative housing model where it was just simply helping each other. It's not what I would have traditionally thought of as a cooperative housing where you're living in the same building or in, in a multi-unit dwelling. But these are things that have been done on Prince Edward Island in the past. They've worked well. And it was interesting to, to hear as well that the size of houses that they were building were not 2,000 feet or square feet or 2,500 square feet. They were between 900 and 1,100 square feet. And that's, that's another thing um, I think that we have to realize in our, our current environment is uh, our expectations of the size of house that, uh, that we, we want to live in have to have to come down. Um, one thing, and this crosses over a little bit with the Department of Finance as well. Um, this is the Down Payment Assistance Program. And, and this is a really great program. Actually, it was one that I fought for when I was in opposition and played a hand in bringing in. Um, Right now, you can't use it for new homes, as far as I can tell. If you want to buy a lot and build a home, you can't, you can't qualify for the Down Payment Assistance Program. It has to be an existing house that you're, you're purchasing. Um, and so I'd like to see that change, considered at least. Another thing is, um, right now, I believe the, uh, the rules have a, a cap on the value of the home that you're allowed to, to purchase. And I... I think it's at $350,000 right now. The problem is, as we well know, the availability of homes that are $350,000 or less is not very high. And so there's, there's people who want to qualify for a down payment. They've got a home they want to buy or a home they want to build, and they, it, it, they dis they're disqualified from the program because the home costs too much to buy it. Simple as that. And of course, they don't qualify to build one at this point. So anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a real change that I'd like you to consider at least. I've never heard any reasons why it couldn't happen. Um, one thing uh, as well that was brought up to me on the campaign trail, um, there's some folks who live over in Rustico, uh, have a, a lot of experience with, uh, with, with, um, with building in particularly environmentally friendly and energy efficient homes. And uh, they said, you know, over in New Brunswick, there's legislation that if you have a housing that's 600 square feet or less, 
you actually don't have to follow the National Building Code. Now, there are rules around it, but it's not the strict National Building Code rules. And you know, a 600 square foot structure is, is, is really, frankly, quite large when it comes down to it. I've seen some of them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big tiny home, I would say. A big tiny home. Is that an oxymoron? I don't know. Anyhow, a 600 square foot, uh, there's, there's a, there, I think that's something that should be considered. Look at the New Brunswick legislation and see what they've done there with allowing 600 square foot or, or um, smaller uh, buildings to be built without adhering to National Building Code. Prove efficiencies and potentially, potentially help the housing situation, although I'm not sure that's really meant for housing in particular. That's something, um, if, uh, if government doesn't have time or doesn't have the priorities to move on it, I might consider bringing that forward as a private member's bill, depending on how things go. A lot of research to be done. Um, one thing I heard time and time again from my constituents is they want to see improved protections for agricultural land. Um, there's people who've moved in and they've, they've said, wow, when I moved here, I moved to the country because I wanted to live in the country and now I've got agricultural land around me that's being taken out of production. I've got hedgerows that are being ripped out and fields that are expanded. And they just want more protections, more rules. They want uh, more protections for forest, trees and hedgerows. Right now, basically, there are little to no rules. If you have trees on your property that aren't in a buffer zone, you can do what you want. Now, it's a double-edged sword. It's nice to have that freedom, but um, we need to look at, and maybe this is a standing committee topic, of how we could protect uh, forests and trees on private land, and, and, and you know, maybe it's incentives that are required. Actually, there's a, I believe it's the Association of Woodlot Owners or an organization like that. I think the, uh, Madam Speaker, I think your husband might even be involved with that. Uh, it was on the news recently. The Sustainable there. Forestry Alliance. The Sustainable Forestry Alliance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, what they're looking at, and they found a way to get uh, carbon, um, to buy carbon credits, and, and the carbon credits can actually be applied to people's yeah. land, their woodlots. To maintain them. So if they maintain them as woodlots, right? Which is a great way. Uh, it's a win-win all the way around. So, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see, uh, you know, private organizations that are pursuing that. So as government, let's support that and see what we can do to help. Um, I think it's really key that we, we focus on central water and sewer and making sure that's a priority for new developments. I think it's going to be good for our environment, but it also, I think, would lend itself well to the sort of development the Department of Land would like to see and, and official planners would like to see. Um, and, it, and the problem is in unincorporated areas, um, there's a lot of pressure just to develop, develop, develop without central water and sewer. I have two subdivisions going up right now. And they're actually in a municipality that has central water and sewer, and the central water and sewer is not being extended out to them. And I, I think, I think the resort, it's the resort municipality, I should say, I think they would have done that with just a little bit of government help, right? But as it is, now we've got, I know it's up to 50 homes, I think they've got their own septic beds and their own wells. There's a program coming, that's great to hear, great to hear. Um, I'd like to see... Oh yes, now, going, talking about uh, rental, residential rentals, um, uh, frankly, uh, I think we have a lot of work to do on the Residential Tenancy Act to improve it. There's a lot of things in there that I wanted as minister, they didn't make it. Um, there were regulatory changes that I'd asked for, gee, it's been a couple of years ago now, that, uh, that took, they were implemented just before the election. And I wasn't happy with them. For example, uh, there's a huge, there's, there was a huge problem, a real problem, where um, if you owned uh, a multi-unit rental property and you'd own that for a, a longer period of time, 10, 15, 20 years, of course, your rent control, the rent controls mean, Madam Speaker, your rents were set at a fairly low level because they're only allowed to go up by the allowable increase year over year. And many, even these larger landlords, wouldn't necessarily take advantage of raising those. So what, what happened was um, at, at, at some point they would want to sell that property, right? Because that's what, that's what landlords do, especially the multi-unit ones. They say, okay, I'm retiring, I'm cashing out, I'm getting my money, I'm gonna, I've, I've, over the years my mortgage is paid off, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to go. Um, but the value of that property had gone up so much, in, especially in recent years, that the people that bought it, there's no way the rents could ever support the amount they paid for that property. 
And so what they were doing was going to Iraq and applying for a greater than allowable rent increase. It, this is a problem that's been talked about a lot. And, and so, you know, now the rents that were maybe $600 a unit, now they were going to like a thousand or eleven hundred dollars a unit to support the new mortgage. So the regulatory change that was pushed through by executive council just before the election said you cannot use uh, mortgage payments, uh, the principal portion of the mortgage payments, to support a greater than allowable increase application. Um, the problem is, okay, for the big multi-unit buildings, this was good, it's going to stop, stop those huge in rent increases, but for the small landlords, this was a real problem. Like I, I have, I, I guess I have a lot of small landlords in my district, and they don't necessarily own the properties in the district, but these are people who bought these places, you know, two, three, four, five properties. They do all the maintenance work themselves. They don't, you know, uh, sub out to a property management firm. And they try and keep all their costs down. And they work really hard. But they're really getting hit because they can't do a rent increase. And the cost of everything has gone up. But there's no mechanism for them to, to raise the rent. And they're, in, and they're losing lots of money every month. And this is, this is their nest egg. This is their retirement. This is what they chose to do instead of, uh, you know, contributing to RSPs and, and, uh, and TFSAs, you know, and trying to invest in the stock market. This is what they did. And um, they can't go in and, and basically apply for any greater than allowable increase as well. The regulatory changes painted all tenants with the same brush. And this is a real problem. Um, I like to think if I was... In cabinet at that time, I would have uh, would have flagged that, and we would have had a different outcome. But uh, anyway, I'm hoping we can change that. The the other thing um, that I I was really fighting hard for, and I got a lot of pushback from the department, and the, the especially the uh, the policy folks, and I never really got a, a good reason why we couldn't do it. And and perhaps the new minister can explain to me. Maybe he understands better. But. Uh, this was alluded to, to in the question set, I believe it was, where I was speaking to a motion to a member from uh, Victoria. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Um, right now, the Residential Tenancy Act is quite complicated. I mean, I, I worked on it for two years, and when it initially was written by uh, an external lawyer that came in, and uh, we had no policy expertise in government, and I, I, I sat and walked through it, and I said, what? This, this, is, this is really complicated stuff. I said, we need some policy folks in-house to look at it. So we, we did that. Um, but when it comes to, um, well, let, let, me, let me back up. So first of all, Iraq is the one that governs this, this complicated act, which is great, because they're, they're a bunch of uh, really qualified legal experts that can do that. They're the ones who make initial decisions whenever there's any uh, disputes over, the re over residential rentals. But they are also the exact same body that the appeals go to when one of their decisions is appealed. That's a conflict of interest. I firmly believe that's, that's a problem. I mean, they try and do a great job at IRAC. I, I, I know the, uh, the director looks after that, and they really try and separate them. But I think at the end of the day, it is a conflict of interest. So what I would like to see is I would like to see that initial uh, governing uh, of the act moved out of IRAC. Similar to the Workers' Compensation Board, it's a separate body, but it's not a quasi-judicial body. It's just a, a, a body separate arm's length from government that can look after uh, and, and, and make rulings on, on, uh, on rentals. And I think just like the Workers' Compensation Board that has an office of the employer advisor and an office of the worker advisor, we should have an office of the landlord advisor, advisor and an office of the tenant advisor. And I think that would go a long way to helping landlords and helping tenants okay. deal with this complicated act. Okay. And um, and you know, and you can you can speak about that when you speak to the speech from the front. There you go. Yes. And um, and I think it would it would it would really help the situation a lot. Um, there could be education campaigns. I mean, the the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park isn't wrong. We're relying on on third party nonprofit organizations right now <coughs> to educate both landlords and tenants. And this is government responsibility, and we should step up. That's what I wanted to do when I was minister. I got a lot of pushback. I still scratch my head as to why. Uh, maybe I've, I wasn't there for a very long time, maybe a little bit longer, and I would have got this through. You never know. But anyway. Um, the other thing um, I'd like to see, and this one would be a little more 
controversial, I'd imagine. You guys are liking me, may, maybe liking me a little bit right now, maybe not going to like me in a minute. Is, uh, is when a, uh, a rental unit is vacated, and this, this is, it's, it's vacant um, for a cause, you know, like this isn't just a, you know, there's a reason that the unit had to be vacant, uh, vacated, so it's empty. We need to change the Residential Tenancy Act and regulations so that the landlord can now set that unit to market rent. It's a change in how we do our rent controls, and, and I firmly believe that should happen. I won't take a long time to talk about our sort of two-tier market we have right now where we have older units at low rents and we have new units at extremely high rents. And, you know, new units, basically, landlords, not only do they have high costs to build them, but they also are encouraged to set the rent as high as possible because based on the legislation, they don't know when they're ever going to get the increase the rents much in the future, right? And so I think if we allow the market to set the rents, at least when new units, what we'll find is those two come closer together in the future. Like I said, this is open. This is one that will cause a lot of debate. This is a lot of debate. But um, anyway, that's what I'd like to see, at least debate it. Um, I'm really excited to see the, the rent to own initiatives that are coming down the pipe. I, that, that's a complicated area. It's not an easy one, but I think there are precedents and there's, there's other jurisdictions we can learn from. I know that uh, Tim Banks, uh, everyone's favorite developer here in the, in the area, has at least one proposal he had on the, on the table, Madam Speaker, where he, he was going to do rent to own. So uh, again, maybe, maybe talk to him if you haven't already about his rent to own plans. He's, he's got a model there that he felt was going to work for him. Good spot to start, someone local, right? All right, um, so when it comes to uh, housing, land, and communities, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, now. And um, I'm going to move on to social development. Oh, sorry, I already talked about that. Social development seniors. I'm getting close to the end, Madam Speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about environment, energy, and climate action next. So the, the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty um, ha has mentioned the Hebrides to me, and I, I'm the leader of the third party, has mentioned it recently as well. So the Hebrides is located in my, uh, my district, and it's very low-lying. We had the Department of Environment out on Monday night, and they did a presentation about climate change adaptation. And when you look at the Hebrides, it was right there in the slideshow, and there are people from the Hebrides at the presentation, um, the whole lower section of it is red, it's underwater. I mean, like now, basically. There's a reason that it was hit so hard. Um, there's a whole section that's in green. The point they made was, even the section in green, you could, you could say, yeah, we're gonna continue to have our cottages there, but your access to those cottages will be completely cut off from the mainland because of, of the other area impacted. So, what does that mean? It means we need to we need to continue to make strides uh, on our coastal hazard information, our education, and our programs that help help landowners who are in those red zones. And I was really impressed with Peter Nishimura and his and his presentation on Monday night. He did a fantastic job, and and really I have to say I, I'm I'm so pleased with our government and the work that's been done on climate change adaptation. It's breaking down the silos between departments, and we've made huge progress there. Um, there's probably other topics that uh, silos still exist we need, like housing, for example, when we make, need to make more progress, but climate change and adaptation is one of the areas we've made a lot. So, uh, last time I talked about allowing net metering across multiple properties, which is an energy issue, which is very important. Um, I'm going to hopefully at some point, if I, if I get the chance, ask questions on um, our, our our strategy and our plan to generate on-island uh, electricity. Right now, I mean, the I, last night I was at the Energy Blueprint session in Kensington, and uh, one of the things in that blueprint, it talks about how in February we had a peak of electricity, I think it was 393 megawatts on the island, which is huge. And in fact, Atlantic Canada, all of Atlantic Canada, like this whole region, was in danger of, there was no more energy we could buy. Like we were using the energy and if we would have gone any higher, they, you know, there, was, there was nothing left for us. And so what does that mean? It means, you know, you know brownouts, blackouts, like we're in. So 
this plan is extremely important. I, I think that's mentioned in the speech from the throne, but it's a critical piece. Um, we've been working really hard to electrify our island, whether that's uh, heating or transportation. Uh, but we're using a lot of electricity, and we have to make sure we can serve those electricity needs. And, and I, I was talking to um, someone who follows this file very co closely, constituent Roger King, and uh, he was saying, we may have put the cart before the horse a little bit here. Um, I know the, the minister uh, responsible for energy had a couple of projects on the go out in Eastern Kings, for example. It's been three years now, and I know he's had his challenges with the delays from the regulatory body, IRAC, but we need to make progress, and we need to do it soon. <coughs> Hopefully, the, uh, Madam Speaker, the, the project up in Skinner's Pond uh, will we'll go ahead because that, that's another one that will provide some significant energy to the island. But we need to, we need to and th these were numbers uh, last night that uh, Roger talked about, I believe it's 35 megawatts of generation or additional energy per year until 2030 if we're going to meet our targets. Now, uh, not to mention the danger of, uh, of you know, brownouts and blackouts. So it's, a, it's very ambitious and the speech from the throne I think addresses that, but uh, going to make sure that we get there. Okay. I've got here pilot energy storage solutions. Um, I'd, I'd love to know what the status of small-scale nuclear energy in the region is. We haven't heard about that in quite a while. Another question maybe for question period someday, but I think it's incumbent on the government to be open with communication and, and just proactively communicate where these things are. Um, we, we got to break down this culture of secrecy around government holding things. I know it's politics and it's tough, but that's what I'd like to work towards. Um, we talked about how we can protect existing forests and trees by introducing incentives or, and or laws and regulations. Maybe use the tax regime to give people tax breaks if they, uh, they keep their property in, in, in wood. Um, one thing that's been brought up, and I don't think we've solved this yet, is uh, if you're a, a landlord that uses oil to heat your apartments uh, and you're a tenant um, who doesn't have any, any say into how that he's provided, we need some way to uh, continue to incentivize landlords to move off. We do have a program for that. I think we need to be more aggressive in that because the tenants at the end of the day are the ones who are paying the price. And um, not to mention we don't get the, the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction. Um, Oh, and this, this is one that was brought up a number of times on the campaign trail. So we've got these really great energy re rebate programs, in particular ones for things like free heat pumps. And we keep raising the threshold of, of income, um, household income. So we went from around 35000 to 55000 I think we're at 100000 now, $100,000 household income. You can still qualify for a free heat pump. So people at the door were like, we were so excited. Finally, we were going to qualify for a government program. You know, these are more like middle-income earners, right? We're going to be able to take advantage of the things we've been watching people for years take advantage of. Heat pumps are amazing. We want to go to heat pumps. But guess what? There was a cap on the value of their property. And, and I think it was $300,000 is, is the maximum value of your property in order, even though if you have your, your household income $100,000 less of your value, your property is worth more than $300,000, you can't qualify for the free heat pump. So we need to look at that, and I, I hopefully that's already changed. Um, I wish the Minister of Energy was here, but I mean, if he was here, if he is here, I'm sure he's listening. I'm sure he's listening, Madam Speaker. And uh, and what we should increase that to be more in line with uh, with really what the value of properties are. Um, and here was another really practical suggestion, and uh, and this is something maybe others have, have thought about. So we have black bins for waste. We have a green bin for compost, but when it comes to recyclables, we use blue bags and we put them all in plastic bags and bring them out to the curb. Yet, the exact same bins could exist. You change the color to blue, you put the recyclables in them, you cover, take them out to the curb. Too much blue in this province. It's a lot more blue. More blue. I think, I think the leader of the third party is right. We need more blue in this province. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so I don't know why that's... That, I mean, on the surface, nothing's ever as simple as it seems, but on the surface, why not have blue bins instead of blue bags and do the same thing? And you have three bins instead of two. Paper and recyclables. 
pa paper and recyclables. It's a great suggestion. Another one. Those are also in bags, and those ones are those ones are brutal. They're heavy. Like you got a few a weeks worth of newspapers and papers, and you try, the bags are up, and you're trying to get it up to the curb. Oh my goodness. Anyway, it's a great idea. There's work to be done there. All right. Well, moving on, Madam Speaker, uh, to education and early years. Um, I think, I, and I think this is something that the minister is already working on, but I wanted to make sure I brought it up. And that's expand programs that teach social and emotional resilience. That's coping with stress trauma. I know this is one of the passion areas that Charlottetown Victoria Park is passionate about. It was something, honestly, uh, to tell the member, I had to push really hard for when I was minister. During the pandemic, we increased the number of um, school counselors, which are, of course, critical helping with this area, at least uh, dealing with uh, kind of after the fact anyway, but they also help with the building of resilience. We were raising, I think we had 13 of them that were added. And then when the, when the budget, the, the, the department came out with the budget and they said, okay, here's the budget we want to go with, they were going to cut them back down and, and get rid of seven of them, go back down to five. And I was like, what are you doing? We fought so hard to get this here, and now you're cutting them back. We're going to need them just as more after the pandemic as we need them during, even more. So that was one change. You may not know, but I fought hard for that. And we got, we actually, we ended up, instead of 13, we ended up with 12. But um, that was all, that was, that was part of, because of all the lobbying you did. I'm not a school counselor. I don't know about those sorts of things, but you did. And so your lobbying made a real difference there. And that's where opposition will make a difference. So. Um, but we need to continue to expand programs to teach social and emotional resilience. Um, I have next, the next bullet is we need to continue to increase the number of school counselors to meet the minister's directive ratio. I'm just going to leave it at that. We need to modify the inclusion policy to better serve both students with special needs and their classes. This is something, Madam Speaker, I didn't see it specifically in the speech from the throne, but I think it's really important. Right now, it doesn't serve the special needs student, and it doesn't serve the classroom when, when they're, they're at the point where they're, they're you know, frankly, uh, disruptive, uh, and it's not a good learning environment for them, and it's not good for the class. There's lots of cases where it really is, and we need to be inclusive where that's the case, but we need to pick and choose those cases. And it's, it's one that's politically delicate, right? Because um, every parent wants to have their child included as much as possible, and we need to do that, but we have to make sure we do it in a smart way so it's the best for the child and the best for the class which is one reason uh, it, it's not something you hear. I think the Minister of Education talk about a lot publicly because it is so controversial, but I'd like to see some movement on that. Um, I think we need to continue to uh, improve the early childhood education compensation to attract workers, like add a benefits package. I think that's in the speech from the throne. I applaud them for that. Um, we need to create a clear path for in-home daycares to qualify for $10 a day child care subsidy. So an in-home daycare is someone, as it sounds, who's looking after children within their home. They may not be an early childhood educator. Um, and right now, as far as I can tell, there's not a clear path for them to qualify for that uh, subsidy that will allow them to offer $10 a day child care. So you're going to end up with licensed centers, early year centers, that can, they have the subsidies, they're going to be able to offer that $10 a day child care. But at the in-home, the in-home daycares, Right now, they're going to be charging 30 bucks a day, you know? And we need to have a clear path to be able to do that. I'm giving you some question ideas here. This is a... And hopefully, the department's listening, and they'll have that solved soon. It's, it's not a simple, uh, simple problem, I wouldn't think, but um, it's one that needs to be addressed. And there's great people who work with, uh, with early years in the department, so I'm sure they're up for the task. Um, we need to provide supports to create new early year centers and expand the existing early year centers to address the huge wait lists. I'm sure almost everybody in the chamber here knows that the early year centers have massive wait lists right now, especially for infants, but also across the board. Uh, I think that's the plan. Um, I'm not sure if it was clearly articulated in the speech from the throne, but I wanted to make sure it's addressed. Um, there's really a huge opportunity, I think, here to partner with nonprofits, profits, and municipalities. Um, I, a great example is the town of Kinkora. I was, I, was, I was very much involved with that. And they're, in fact, the CAO for the town of Kinkora is an early childhood educator. 
and then one of the one of the members of council was passionate about providing childcare in the area, and they partnered together, and they now run a really a large early years centre out of the, the municipal office. Yeah, um, they're expanding. In fact, and they had 200 people on the wait list, and they already were handling what was it 50 or 60 kids a day, so obviously needed. And the town, it's great. It's a great model. Now, in this case, the the CAO happens to also be an ECE, early childhood educator, so it really worked well. But now, typically, the director of an EYC doesn't want to have to deal with that paperwork. They're, they're there, and their background is they love working with kids and teaching kids, and that's, that's their expertise. They don't want to have to deal with all the finance and the business, the business stuff. This, this way, those administrative functions can be taken on by the town and let them focus on running the center. And so it's a really, it's a really good thing. And I, I'm looking at the Minister of Communities and he's nodding his head and the Minister of Finance is thinking I could probably give some money to that, so this is good. Um, the other thing I really like to see in education, uh, we heard today, in, I believe it was in question period, how uh, you know, the school food program needs more money in order to, uh, in order to, to meet the needs of students. Um, frankly, uh, I was never really happy with the model that we, we ended up rolling out. During, during, the, uh, during the pandemic, um, we needed to get food to kids at home that we knew needed food. And so the Department of Social Development partnered with uh, local vendors, restaurants, to create what we know as school food lunches today that could be delivered twice a week um, to homes to help kids and fight food insecurity. And then that just carried on. There's really only, it, well, the entire uh, CSLF, uh, French Language School Board, has in-school kitchens that are hubs, you know, where they make the meals at the school, and they can involve the kids in preparation of the meals if they want to. And I'm not sure they're actually doing that, but that, that was a vision down the road. But I think, again, actually, it's uh, uh, Kinkora um, Re Regional High School. Is that the proper name? Yeah. Kinkora Regional High School. Concora Regional High School is also a hub, but there's very few hubs in our schools. And the idea was to have hub per family school, and, and typically in, in the high school. And then you could actually teach the kids. You could provide, you could use products from the local area. I can, at uh, Concora Regional, they do an amazing job. They actually take potato, potatoes that are growing on the farms of the students and bring them in, and, and, and other produce as well. So there's no reason why we couldn't do that at other schools. Um, but we need to get into the school food hubs, Madam Speaker. I think that's the vision. I would like to see a kitchen like that for every family of schools. And in fact, possibly even someone who's responsible for food, not a teacher, teachers already have enough on their plates, in every school that's responsible for dealing with food issues in the school and making sure that students have it. And then, if you have that person in place, now if you want to expand and, and do breakfast as well, it's much easier. Right now, it's volunteers are doing an incredible job with the breakfast programs. And most schools have a breakfast program because of the work of great volunteers. Um, and we, we need to continue to support them. I mean, $30,000 in, in our election platform is a drop in the bucket. But as we've always said, a little bit of money goes a long ways when it's in the hands of volunteers. Right? Um, the other thing, and I hear this time and time again, and again, the dietitians who work with the school food program are, are fantastic. They want to make that truly healthy food that, that uh, adheres to the Canadian uh, food guide, etc. But we need to make sure we're making food that kids want to eat. I think that would help get the cost down. I hate to say it. Um, we need to make it as healthy as possible. Well, not as healthy. We need to make it healthy, but we don't need to make it as healthy as possible. I think we need to you know, bend the rules a little bit. In fact, some of these hub schools, they still have pizza Fridays, even though technically that's not, that's not in the healthy food realm. Uh, but it's really important. I know my son, he doesn't want to eat any of the school food, you know? And, and that's a, a common thing I hear. Um, we, we need to, we, I think we also need to um, improve the ordering process, make it more accessible. Uh, again, we've heard some talk about that study that says, um, the children in food insecure households has actually increased, even though we have some of these measures in place. I mean, obviously the households don't have enough money to buy healthy food, but I don't think they necessarily have the wherewithal to actually order the food for their kids at school. 
So guess who that falls on? The SPACs of teachers again, and they do a great job. They order extra meals every day, and they give it out to the kids that know they need them. But I think if we improve the order process, we work on that, I think we could do it better. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm providing some constructive criticisms here. Like, don't get me wrong, the people who work with the school food program, PEI School Food Program Inc. do a fantastic job, and I do want to give them kudos. Um, anyhow, um, one thing also as well in education, and uh, it, 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 frankly it applies to most government-owned infrastructure, especially seniors' housing and schools. Um, we do a good job about budgeting for the major repairs. Okay? If you need a roof replaced, if you need to replace the HVAC system, you know, there's a wall that's falling down, you put it back up, all these sort of things. But we don't allocate enough money for the forward-facing things that impact people in everyday life. So, you know, when you're, you're in a school and you come into the foyer, it's like, oh, we really could use a fresh coat of paint there. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. Let's provide more, more, more of that. You go into the bathroom and there's gaps in the bathroom stalls, you know, especially, um, you know, those who identify as female that are in, in those bathrooms, they, they, want, they want to have their privacy. And if there's gaps in the stalls, it's just not good. There's mirrors where the, the, you know, the silver is peeling off them. And they just sit there because there's not enough money in the budget. The big things are being addressed, but the smaller facing, uh, front facing things. And so I, I had asked the department to set aside a chunk of the budget every year just for front facing things. I know that you could put all that money towards big things as well, and some of those big things might be pushed out a little bit, but I, I want to make sure that that continues to happen because it's so important. Again, it comes back to our, our well-being of, of, of everybody who works there as well as students. And in the case of, uh, in the case of seniors, it's simple things like uh, just replacing a floor. Like the current floor may be okay. There may be not be something super wrong with it. It's worn. It doesn't look that great. There's not an urgent need to replace the floor, but you replace that floor and everybody in there feels fantastic. You put a new coat of paint on the walls, it, it just improves things so much. So let's set aside a portion of our budget um, across departments for front-facing mental well-being things. Anyhow, so that's, that was my feedback, education in early years. I'm sure there's teachers that say, why didn't you mention this, that, and the other thing, but that's what I'm gonna go with. Um, the next I had here was intergovernmental affairs and indigenous relations. One thing I heard, in particular from dairy farmers, was uh, we need to improve the process for foreign workers, temporary foreign workers, and, and foreign workers in general, to make it more efficient and encourage them to stay permanently on PEI. Um, there's one dairy farm in particular, basically, they bring in people, they train them up, and everything's going well, and then they leave, and it's just a two-year cycle. And um, there's got to be ways to improve that. They have a whole bunch of great ideas, and it's, it will require the provincial government working with the federal government to make that happen. Um, we also, and this is something I talked about, but I want to talk about it again. Uh, at my peril, perhaps as a third term MLA, I can talk about this. So employment insurance. Right now, we have a severe shortage in our workforce, right? Um, one thing that I've already talked about a little bit is the Career Connect program. A student came to me and said, look, right now it's great. I love the Career Connect. I can work in the, in the summer after, my, after I've already gone uh, through one year of school. And I can, make, I can earn EI or I, I can receive EI while I'm going to school. The problem is it's clawed back so quickly if you decide to work as a student and there's really no incentive to work at all because you're getting the EI. And, and I've heard time and time again at the doors, how come we don't see our students working out in particular in the retail jobs anymore? What happened to them? It used to be, it was always a student that greeted you when you're going to a fast food restaurant or you went down to a, a retail shop. But now we don't see them anymore. And this, the opinion of the, uh, this person was, hey, it's because Students are qualifying for a Career Connect. They don't have to work part time, and instead of working five hours a week at that retail job, you know, they're not working. So let's look at that. And students, you know, well, that would definitely be controversial. But if you if you qualify for the Career Connect program, why not make it a make it a requirement? You have to work five hours a week, or at the very least, if you work, you don't get clawed back until you're all over twenty hours a week or something like that. 
Um, anyways, I'd encourage that to be looked at. And this is something as well. Um, EI plays a really important role for our seasonal workers. And, and I don't want to touch, I don't want to talk about that today. Um, but when it comes to government, you know, it's very clear and it's something everybody's known for years and years and years. Government takes advantage of federal EI. And we have 15 week work crews that go on, get their hours, and then they get laid off and you bring on another crew. To me, that does a disservice to the workers, it does a disservice to the government, and it does a disservice to the job they're doing. And I've talked to workers and they said, I'd love to get off that cycle, but I don't know how. And guess what? It's not a good life to live, because you have to find, the, I mean, doing that 15 weeks and then going on EI doesn't really give you enough money to live a uh, really a life out of poverty, like you're in poverty. So it actually supports the underground economy. A lot of people are working under the table because, again, because of the clawbacks related to EI and the fact that they need to do that until they get their next uh, work with the government. And I, this is a very hot topic, an unpo unpopular topic. I'm sure there's some MLAs here just covering their eyes and saying, why are you even talking about this at all? But I think it's time someone talked about it. It's time someone looked at it. You don't have to be very public about it. I don't care. Just look at it and see if it makes sense for government to be using EI in this current environment where we have so many workforce positions that are open, um, really discouraging people from going into the workforce. Uh, going back now on to the finance area, I already talked about the down payment assistance program. Um, I also, of course, expect that that uh, finance will be involved with the housing file quite a bit with creating and supporting rent-to-own initiatives. Uh, I asked questions today about freezing property taxes for rental properties, not just owner-occupied properties. There's a lot of details there. Um, you may go to your department and say, yeah, uh, maybe he's got some misinformation in his questions. <laughs> That's quite possible, but I would love to find out. I would love to find out what the deal is and why we can't do that. <coughs> if we can't, hopefully we can. Um, unlinking, unlinking property taxes from inflation, I think, is critical. I, when that was brought in, uh, it just doesn't make sense. And in fact, that's probably something should be in this piece from the phone, looking at at linking thresholds for things like housing assistance to CPI. It's a, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I've talked about it before with the department at length, and it, it does create a number of problems, but I think there's solutions that can be found. Um, and then it's great to see the speech from the phone talking about um, some tax solutions to help with our cost of living scenarios, uh, where we can review and adjust the tax, tax brackets and things like that. Was there a jurisdiction that just recently announced that they're... they're uh, and maybe it's out in Alberta where there's an election, they're going to have an 8% tax bracket under $60,000, right? Which goes, you know, from 17% to 8%. So they're doing that to combat uh, cost of living. So in finance, I'm excited to see what you come up with in terms of tax adjustments to help with cost of living. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, Madam Speaker, is, uh, and th this is really at the executive council level. Um, the, f the first thing is um, breaking down silos. I think uh, the Premier and, and, uh, and Cabinet has done a great job of, of trying to break down silos, mentioned climate change adaptation, I think housing. Uh, I actually had a special Cabinet Committee on housing before when I was Housing Minister, and it was very challenging with Ministers have all their own responsibilities to put their time into that special housing committee was really, really challenging. Frankly, I think that, I mean, I'm glad to see housing together with land and communities. Maybe even all three of those things need to say, you need to sit up in the executive council office. Maybe that's where you'll end up. You don't have a permanent office yet. But there are things that go across multiple departments and require so much input from other departments, housing, land, and communities, that um, they need an executive council focus in order to break down silos. And uh, we'll see. That was my recommendation when I was minister uh, to the premier. And I think maybe this department change is part of that. Um, but I would I think there has to be a focus on executive council, and maybe it's a, maybe it's more than just the cabinet committee, special cabinet committee on housing. Maybe it's like we have a climate change secretariat. Maybe it's a housing secretariat as well. One of those for executive council. So 
right now I'm hearing that there are two deputy ministers and one does work for executive council. So good, that's really good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. I think that'll maybe help tackle this problem. It's, it, it's such a, it really does go across multiple departments and silos are really a problem in, in trying to address it. Um, lastly, uh, an executive council, and, and now there is work going on um, with service PEI, but right now, I mean, I, I was privileged, I guess is one way to put it, to be minister of several different departments. Um, I mean, I was education, lifelong learning, environment, it was water and climate change at the time, social development and housing. And really, in, there was no standard way in any department that requests came into the department. There was no standard way to collect information about the request, um, to categorize, to, to tag with keywords, to find out the status and track the status, to indicate the timelines from when it was, was input to when it was closed. And um, what, it, what it amounts to is uh, it meant we weren't able to provide as good a client service. It was probably redundancy within staff members and, and less efficiency. And at the end of the day, it didn't allow for executive level reporting that would allow you to, to determine where the problem areas were. Like, um, I, I don't even know if you can get the, the statistics out of the Department of Land, for example, on uh, permits and uh, how many are in the queue and how long they've been open and all those things. Maybe you can. Hopefully there is a system that does that. But I know that there are a number of people with information systems backgrounds now in Cabinet, including the Minister of Health, Minister of Housing and Land Communities, I think the Minister of Finance, do you have a information okay. systems? Pete, people know what's going on when it comes to information systems. So what I'm lobbying for, um, and I think there may be the beginnings of this in service PEI, I think I'm going to meet with them. Uh, they reached out to me already because I mentioned this the other day, but I want to make sure the scope is big enough because I think it has to go across all government. I want to see like a client service department for government anyway. Um, what we used to call it back in the day was an action request system. CSM. CSM is another way to put it. But you would have, in, in, in my vision, when you call in the government, you are assigned a representative that is your representative in government. And then they work with you to put you in contact with the right departments. And when the departments have their answer back, it goes back to the client service representative. They go back to the client and they don't close that until the client is satisfied or they determine there's no more that can be done. And maybe it's got a bad rating, like I was dissatisfied. But it would, it would just, I think, improve things so much. I think it's, it's what most large private companies do today. And uh, so that's, that's one thing I'm, I'm glad to see uh, ministers taking notes and listening here. I really appreciate the, the fact that you are. Um, so that's my, my feedback uh, on the speech from the throne. Um, like everybody has done, um, this was my fourth election, and I wanted to thank everybody in District 18, Rustico Emerald, who supported me and put your trust in me to be your MLA again. I especially wanted to thank uh, my campaign team this time around, led by, uh, by Stephanie Most. She was my, uh, my campaign manager. Um, Tracy Weeks ran the <coughs> office. Um, Ann Zakem was my driver manager, and, and she really made sure that things were hopping. Um, Ryan Williams also did uh, amazing work, really uh, across the board, as it were, and so many other people who, uh, who worked to make it possible for me to be back here to represent District 18 Rustico and Marine. So with that, uh, Madam Speaker, thank you, and I am done responding to speech from the throne. Okay. I have a member from Board and Confora. I'll take a moment to recognize uh, two individuals in the gallery. Uh, from actually District 19. Uh, Jackie Affleck, uh, a great registered nurse from Prince County Hospital that worked with my, my wife uh, for, for quite a while in the oncology and chemotherapy. And, and uh, somebody is definitely a credit to our nurses out there in the job that she does uh, in Prince County Hospital. And we also, she joined with her husband, uh, Randall, who is a, is, a, is, a, is a great dairy farmer uh, down in the uh, down in the Collins Point area. and. Uh, I enjoy my little, the odd time we get to have a chit chat there with Randall and, and I always enjoy that because he, he tells it the way it is and uh, he's so passionate about the agriculture industry and, and taking care of our land and stewards of it. 
and uh, that's something that's well noted in my mind because uh, we need more rentals out there in, um, in, in how they how they farm manage the systems in our agriculture across the province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable member from uh, Charlton Winslow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise today to uh, speak to the uh, speech from the throne. Um, of course, I do want to send a big thank you to. Uh, Everybody in District 10, um, it, it was a, a very unique, uh, different experience for me this time actually being able to go and knock on people's doors and, you know, hear their thoughts in person, hear their concerns. Um, in 2020, I wasn't able to, uh, to go door to door at the time because uh, of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. So you get a different perspective when you talk to uh, people, Mr. Speaker, with, uh, with regards to, uh, you know, some people might be a little reluctant to tell you something on the telephone, but, you know, when you meet them face to face and, you know, they might be able to speak their concerns a little bit more. So it, it was a great experience for me going door to door. Um, now, specifically with uh, uh, relation to the uh, throne speech, I, I, I do find a lot of things that I'm very interested in, and I know a lot of this will be flushed out uh, in the near future. But um, one thing that I'm very, very, very excited for uh, is the adding care providers, of course, and the patient advocates to support patients in waiting rooms. Um, I'm not sure what that exactly entails, but uh, I'm very excited to hear that because I'm going to just use one very quick example. When I was at the ER recently um, to get something done to my eye, and it was funny, one of the nurse managers came out. And, you know, of course, when you're spending time in the, uh, in the emergency room, everybody's a little frazzled and everybody has, you know, their concerns and everyone thinks that their concern is probably the, the biggest concern in the room and then you feel bad for the person beside you. But the nurse manager came out and just had said, um, just want to let everyone know that we are running a little bit behind because of some other uh, emergencies that so, you know, you all all get seen, but it might not be in the most timely fashion that you think. And that, that as, a, as a person, it put me a little bit at ease. So I'm sure that the uh, supports or the patient advocates to support patients in waiting rooms will be something that people who have had to visit the waiting rooms or the ERs will definitely like. Um, one thing that I also liked uh, was the, uh, and talking with the uh, advanced learning minister um, about the increases to the uh, George Coles bursary. You know, I, I did talk to a lot of uh, post-secondary students and one of the, the, the funny thing, Mr. Speaker, is one of the things that was brought to me is you talk to the parents of a lot of the post-secondary students and their concern was the costs of post-secondary education along with all the rising costs. So to see an increase in the continuation, I know that there was a Liberal government that had brought that forward a long time ago, so I'm very excited to see that. Um, one question, especially, uh, I know the member from uh, Rusco Emerald touched on this a little bit, but um, in, uh, in his area and also in my area in Winslow, um, you know, a, a lot of people are used to that area being more of a rural area um, with a lot of bigger farms and a lot of uh, older farms, but of course, for those of us who live in Charlottetown and you know see that uh, the urban sprawl in Charlottetown starting to spread out, so we're seeing a lot of these which were once big farm areas, maybe for maybe not as big in comparison to some of the more rural parts of PEI, but in in Charlottetown specifically, you know it was always a very cool thing when you would open up your front door and you'd see a cow pasture in front of you and now what's happening is, is you're seeing and this is in Winslow right you're 10 minutes from downtown Charlottetown but now what we're seeing is, is a lot of uh, development and there's a line under our land the land use plan will help support our agriculture sector primarily through ensuring agricultural land stays in agricultural production you know I, I know that a lot of residents in Winslow were curious about that as well um, the one thing that I absolutely absolutely love because it was uh, something that uh, a constituent of District 10 actually talked to me about was a volunteer tax credit. Um, a lot of people uh, on PEI volunteer, especially in a lot of sports. Um, we actually got a note uh, today from the uh, West Royalty Softball Association saying we're looking for more volunteers. We're looking for more volunteers to help coach um, you know, some of the teams. Um, and I, I think that, again, people volunteer out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, but it is never a bad thing when you are being recognized, um, whether it be financially, because a lot of times if I'm driving up to Tignish for a softball game and I'm going to coach a team that maybe my daughter can't even be at the game, you know, that's my time and that's my gas money to get there. So just a little recognition. I don't know how that's going to be brought in, but I'm very excited about that. Um, I only have maybe two other things. Uh, one thing that um, I, I think it was talked about by a few members already is the cyberbullying prevention strategy. Um, I think that this is so needed and I'm so excited to hear the details of when this comes out 
Because again, being a father of younger children, and, and I see this, Mr. Speaker, where you know, um, it, it's unfortunate, I think, because I remember when my nieces were a little bit younger, and I couldn't believe it when they were in grade nine, and they would get a cell phone, and I'm like telling my sister, I'm like, it's crazy, your daughter's in grade nine, why is she on a cell phone? My daughter's in grade six, and she's on a cell phone. So, you know what I mean? It's gone full circle. And, you know, we try as parents as best we can to guide our daughters, but at the same time, we, we don't know all the strategies. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what this is because a lot of bullying, um, as you know, Mr. Speaker, can happen online and it can happen under, you know, as a parent, you're always trying to watch out for your kids and you're like, I'm going to, you know, try to help my child through this. But so I'm very excited to hear the details on this. I don't know exactly what it is. And the last one I wanted to talk about, uh, Mr. Speaker, is the uh, Partners in Care, the, the Partner in pa Care program. This was something that was brought up a lot on the campaign trail um, because, again, uh, in the areas that I represent in Winslow and in Sherwood, um, there are a lot of those uh, people who, there, first of all, there's a lot of people that still want to remain in their home, which is great, but they're getting up in years. And in a lot of cases, it becomes the parents' responsibility to kind of help. And, you know, they're, it, it, you know some of these parents are working full-time jobs or some of them have to take away some of their time from their own work to, to look after um, you know, their, their parents. And I, I'm seeing this myself, Mr. Speaker, with my parents as they get a little bit up in age and you know, they start to get a little bit more frail and they need a little bit more care and attention. So I, I do think because a lot of times you know, the encouragement is to try to keep people in their homes a little bit longer. So I think that that is uh, a great thing as well. Um, and do you know what? I, I think, Mr. Speaker, on that note, uh, I think my... my I don't really have much else to say to the uh, budget or to the throne speech. Rather, I, I I think there's been a lot of good things in there. There's a lot of things that you know. Once the operating budget comes forward, I, I hope that you know there is the money and there's going to be enough funding to make some of these come to fruition. But I, I do always thank you for your time and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to speaking to this uh, document. Uh, can I uh, grab the podium here before we get going too far into it? Um, it's, a, it's an important, uh, I think a speech from the throne is very important, especially to put in the context of, of what's happening in your district and what's happening to the people's, uh, the people's lives in your district. And I, and I think that we all we all went to the door, and, and I try to, I'll try to frame this in the, in the, in the lives of the, the people that live in my area, um, in the West Royalty area, because I think it's important. And um, they, they, their voices need to be heard, and, and they should come out here in, uh, in this legislature. Um, before I get started, I want to I thank, um, for coming in, uh, Bethany Morrison, who's here today. And... Um, you know, she, she's coming to watch, and, and I'm excited you're here because Bethany, she has worked tirelessly for the Charlottetown Community Fridge. Um, every day she's down there. She works. She, she knows what's on. She's made the relationships with people. Um, she has cared for the people that use that fridge like they're part of her own family. And uh, thank you for, for your service to others. It is noted. Um, and I, I have enjoyed our conversations and, and what you're doing is so important and you're filling a gap and you, you, just, you just care about people. And she would be able to, if she was allowed to be on this floor, she would be able to talk to you about the need of food insecurity firsthand. So Minister, you might want to have a quick conversation with her um, to, to figure out the, the, um, the gaps. Um, the, um, the Charlottetown Community Fridge was one that started by Sandra Sunell and her family. And at the time, I remember Sandra came to, to talk to a, a group of us. And at the time, I thought this project, this is before it was there, this project is too big. It's too, it's too much. Nobody, how can you keep a community fridge going 24 hours? It, it was very daunting. And um, a, a few of us said, look, Sandra, you are... You're so passionate about this. You see the need. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's all do it together. And that's where the, the, the community fridge started. And then from there, it's what, what has happened in our communities. What has happened in the Summerside community has, has uh, and, the, and uh, the West River community and, and in the eastern part of Prince Edward Island, you see the need 
And I think a lot of the community fridges, once they come up, you, you're surprised at how much they're being used. I, I think it, it really, it's really astonishing. So I want to thank Second Harvest. I want to thank Sobeys Superstore, all the people that put time and effort into keeping those things going. As much as we, we harp on the, the big business, they, for them to give to the community what they are not using for others is crucially important. And this is how we, this is not an answer to food security. This is a stopgap for us to figure out how we both fund the community fridges and how we, how, we, how we eliminate this problem to get those numbers down. Because 30, 35 plus percentage of children living in food insecurity is, is, not, is not adequate for our, for, for our community and we can do better. Um, so saying that, um, I, I just want to, I think the best thing to do in, in, in life and in here is to look back at the past. Um, so I just want to, uh, help the, the new members in here and, and some of the some of the uh, the people watching online the three or four people watching online um, to, uh, to to give them a little bit of a of a history lesson in how, how we got to this position uh, we are so I'm going to do that by just looking at the um, the old speech from the throne the, the 2021 speech from the throne so um, yeah we, wow. you wow yeah so yeah just even because we can find out why in this side of the house, we get so passionate sometimes about, about asking these questions and, and figuring things out. So it's there for all the new members. It's there to look back, uh, uh, go back in time where this was a speech from the throne to reset post-COVID. Post um, here it is. It has, it, if this was about COVID, we, we couldn't really talk to the speech from the throne. But this one was post-COVID. Uh, the government put it in to say, here, we're going to hit the reset button and we're going to start, we're going to start new. And um, that, was, that was important. And uh, I remember I, I spoke at length to that speech from the throne about a number of various issues. So I'm going to speak in brief. No, no, I'm not the same one. This is, uh, this is, I don't even really have any notes. So we'll just go. How does that sound? Interesting. Try to make it interesting. So. Um, the first thing in that in that uh, in that speech was um, the uh, the line in here that, that says change will not happen overnight. The process is designed to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary, and that was that was in um, that was in communication about healthcare, about healthcare. And I look at that and I thought a lot about that. Is change will will not happen overnight. The process is designed to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Is it? Do we need? Do we? Do we need an evolution, or is this a revolution? Or um, in the next speech from the throne, we talk about being a modernization. So, uh, if we're going to modernize something, is it evolutionary, or revolutionary? It better. It better. This 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 line confused me. It confused me to figure out where we're going and why it's even in here. The first step in the process is creating three new primary care homes. Um, <clears throat> the primary care homes will have quicker access and appropriate health care professionals. This was in 2001. This speech from the throne created all kinds of questions back in the day. It created, um, I remember we went to a, a church and got briefed about, we didn't, we didn't know what the medical homes were, how they differed from the existing model. Um, so this, is, there's still questions. This was in 2021, there's still questions. And I have questions about, how this is providing better access to care. Is this providing access to care? Because when I went to the election, when I went in the election and went to people, they, they, didn't, really, they didn't really know how these were affecting. They're, they're so nervous about their health care that they're almost crossing their fingers and hoping we're going to be there for them. And you, 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 you all know that feeling at the door. When we tell them it's going to be OK, when we want to be able to go, here's, here's what we've done. And uh, sending them to an online, uh, an online portal is a, is a, is a stopgap. It's not, it's not there. It's important. Maple is very important. And it services a lot of people. I'm worried for the people that aren't able to access that online because that creates a further stress and a block. So I, I think that it needs to be, if it's going to be evolutionary, you have to be there, able to teach people along the way how to use it. And it talks about, it talks about, um, um, things in here that, that, are, uh, that are important and I was like, well, we might, we might get somewhere. We might get somewhere with, with the vision here. And then um, quickly moving on to 
That was about healthcare. There was not really much in there about about um, doctors or about getting more doctors. It was always maybe visionary. It was more a move to to a, a system and and bricks and mortar rather than addressing the concerns of the 30,000 people on the patient registry. That cannot ever stop to be our focus. It cannot stop to be our focus. And because each one of those 30,000 people is a lot of people and each one of them has individual needs and we can't say here, um, this is what we put in place and, and we're gonna get the patient registry down to zero because I need them to have the access when they need it. It has to be there for them. I mean, and, and you know, I'm hearing from constituents that say that their names have been put in the lottery to be able to, to figure out if they get a doctor, a nurse practitioner, or nothing. And I don't know if you've heard the same concerns. That is not, that is not healthcare in our province. That, is, that causes stress to the people, and particular people in my, they needed it the most. Shouldn't it be based on need? I, I don't know how this system's working, if we can provide these things. We have to do better, and we have to be accountable in this legislature to the actions, to the actions that affect our constituents. And that's what I want to see happen. Moving on to, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the old speech from the throne, and this is important and timely. I asked questions about this today. My government will also introduce a single point of access for mental health and addiction services. Islanders will have access to a 24-7 service to help navigate the system to ensure the person is receiving appropriate, timely attention. That was on February 25th, 2021. If you remember back to my questions today, I talked about that service not provided, being provided where we are now. We're in 2023. If it was that important, we would see it in the speech from the throne now. We would see this service being operated because you, your government, said it was going to happen. And, and there's not an MLA in here who didn't talk to people about mental health concerns, trauma that will lead to mental health concerns, kids with mental health concerns. You have done some things. You have done some things that are very important for this. But don't put it in, don't put it in here that we're getting 24-hour access to a service. And that's what that's that's in the speech from the throne. That's what I want to see happen. It's your words. I need to keep you accountable, and I will do that. We see since then, for example, the, the, the Charlottetown police saw over 2,000 mental health calls. And in 2022, and this is an important stat, um, in 2022, they saw 352 attempted or threats of suicide. That was last year. That's an increase of over 120%. Yet, we don't have a service that we talked about in the speech from the throne. Those are serious numbers. Those are lives that need this service to be there. Those are a suicide barrier on the Hillsborough Bridge that needs to be there. Those are listening to the national statistics about what happens and making sure we're proactive about mental health, suicide, and addictions in our province. We don't have time to wait. We have to do it now. And it's the start of a new mandate, but I'm going back to see to show you why, why when I talk about these things that I remain passionate, because these are concerning numbers. Um, the mental health campus, when, when, when the Premier first arrived uh, last year, four years ago, uh, it was it was it was promised that I, I know that when when you stand up and you say shovels in the ground on on day one um, it's it's election talk but but you don't make election talk with a mental health campus that I'm trying to say to you going back to the last speech from the throne that we need Islanders need this the cops 
the police officers are being called 2,000 times. Mental health or suicide rates are up. Our unhoused population is growing. And anytime you say that, that Park Street, the, the development of Park Street was something that my government did, you responded very well to an immediate crisis. That's what you did by having that there. You responded poorly to the overall crisis. And that's, that's a major difference. We need to continue to work together into this field. And again, we plan on being here because it's the right thing to do in opposing difficult topics because that will make you do your job, which the people of Prince Edward Island have put you into cabinet to make those difficult decisions. Um, the mental health services, the, 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 in, this, in this speech from the throne, it said, my government will establish the PEI Center for Mental Well-Being. In that, it said it would establish a center for mental well-being. We, we know that that really didn't, didn't, didn't happen. The government has invested in a different direction. The, the government went in a different direction sometime after the speech from the throne and sometime in the next few months they went in a different direction. But the reason this was in here was because we understood the acute nature of needing services for mental health concerns for Islanders. The different direction helps, helps community groups, um, gets community groups money to, to look at um, upstream mental health issues, upstream different things, which I'm a big supporter of. But it didn't deal, it didn't deal with, with what you said you were going to do in here. So looking back, I need that to happen. I needed whatever your plan was to happen, and I also needed this one to happen. And you just said, we're not doing this one, we're gonna do this one instead. And that's not good enough, because we needed both. We needed both. In this speech from the throne from 2021, my government will introduce measures for harm reduction for those, for those in challenging times in their lives. We fast forward to 2023, I think we are still struggling with the definition of harm reduction. I think this government kind of does harm reduction one day and not the next. I don't know if you know what harm reduction is. I have no idea. And if you do, you can explain it to me and I will be glad to debate you on any actions this government's taken on harm reduction because it's not, it's not happening. It's not happening coordin coordinatedly. Harm reduction is a process. Harm reduction, everybody in the community has to get behind harm reduction. It, it has to be done. If, if there's some organization practicing, practicing in abstinence, which is not harm reduction, and others practicing harm reduction to help people, to help people that have fallen into trouble and we didn't do the, we didn't do the, draw, the, the job to potentially keep dangerous substances off the streets that are highly addictive, and it's no fault of their own. Once you get into a cycle of dependency, it is hard to get off. And we see it in Charlottetown. So harm reduction says, we will get you off that slowly. We're here to help you. Um, you, you will have full supports. And to, to move forward on this, we have to all get together. We saw, we saw you take strides with harm reduction and you hired an amazing harm reduction coordinator through, through the CPHO. You, it's, he, he's there, he's fantastic, he's incredible. And guess what happened? Started to put things in place, started to, to be there and started to make some changes happen until, until the pressure got too much, until the pressure got too much on this government, he said, well, I didn't think that's what harm reduction really meant. I didn't think we had to, I didn't think that anybody would be there because we didn't, 
educate the community on harm reduction and how it would help the community. You made it political. You, 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 you sat there and you pitted from, from, from the time you took office, you pitted a community against each other with not communicating what the steps were in that community. And if you would like, I can outline the entire thing. I can help. You can help, yeah. You can fill, we can both outline the entire thing because we were here when it happened. And I'm saying communication, communicating with people, we talk about it all the time. Communicating with people, especially the people that allowed us to sit here and represent them is first and foremost. You did not communicate whether it be the location of the every center, you're moving it, you're buying a curling club, the data was the, the the data the sport we couldn't get any information we didn't know what you were doing sat in here and the, the former minister sat here and asked them on the floor of the legislature did you buy a curling club like, it's a very simple question oh i don't know uh, we'll have to get back to you on that we'll have to get back to you on that and look where look where we are now i wanted that minister to talk to the community to tell the community and bring them in and let them be part of the solution and it didn't happen And he did a good job today. <laughs> That's debatable. And, and then yet, then you ask a harm reduction coordinator and Peers Alliance to set, to, to, to set up in 2023. You, you, you set up, this is an important, crucial services to help people get off. And you know what? You didn't talk to the community at the beginning. You did not talk to the community at the beginning. And you, you said, hey, you know what? This is where it's going to go. We've already started renovations on the building. Here we go. Harm Reduction Center shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be a problem. No problem. Everybody's on board. Hey, why doesn't the Harm Reduction Coordinator get out in front and talk about this? Keep in mind, this is an essential service. And the community could not be more ready to help. But you didn't talk to them. You didn't allow them to come in. Instead, you sent a friend of mine, and I don't know, I don't know how that you sent a friend of mine in during an election as a candidate to deliver news in the government from the government. An unelected official trying to win a seat, you sent him in front of, 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 of a group unless he did it on his own. And I don't think he would do that. I think you gave him information to say, hey, you know what? We're not moving ahead with this right now. We're not moving ahead with this essential service because it got too much. It got to be too much. Instead of talking to the community from one point to the next, you, you, you threw him under the bus. And guess what? I'll be asking for an apology for my friend. You shouldn't have done that to him. Just trying to, try, trying to represent his community and represent my friend as a diverse member of my community, and you did that to him. So this is why I'm upset. These are some of the reasons why I'm upset. And the last one, well, not the last one really. No, I got more here. That one's a big one. Um, in the last speech from the throne, you talked about microloan program for underrepresented population will be established to provide islanders who identify as BIPOC, indigenous women, 2S, LGBT youth, necessary to assist their own, their, their own business and chart their own course in life. I could not, I talked about this one, if, you got, if some of the members remember, I talked about this one for a while. Yeah, to chart their own business, I love that. But remember we talked about it before, I talked about loans, loans are not the thing to do to build equity with marginalized community. But you said, when we talked about it back and forth, then you came back and said, you know what, we're listening, and I was so excited, you're listening, and we're going to, we're going to make these grant programs. We're going to make these grant programs, we're going to do a hybrid grant loan program, and away we went. Then I chased you for the next two years just to understand what you were talking about because you talked to the speech from the throne. I wanted to know what was happening, what are you doing, this, please tell me this wasn't words, 
to, to just get out of question period or to talk from the speech when thrown, because it meant something to me. I need marginalized communities to get ahead, and that's through equity. That's why they deserve grant programs, not loan programs. So I wanted that to go out, yeah. And I still, to this day, I still, to this day, don't know what happened with that program. When I asked people inside, they, they, they were like, well, we're giving, we're giving funding here and there and, and everything else. It's been so long that all this, this, this funding's all mished together. I couldn't sleep over this because I, I knew what it could mean to businesses. I knew what it could mean to people that struggle in society to get them ahead. I still don't know where it is. And, and that, that, that bothered me for that, from that speech from the throne. You know, so, so saying that, and, and we're talking about, I talked about mental health, health in here, and as I transition to the, to the next speech from the throne, I could actually talk about mental health in, in this last speech from the throne. It was fantastic. It was like, there was a section in there, I, I educated myself, I looked, and I, I, I looked into different things, and it was a, it was a great section that, that, that charted a course. The new speech from the throne, like, tell me it wasn't an oversight. Tell me that we're not in a mental health crisis. We're, we're not in a mental health crisis, and you mentioned mental health once? You mentioned mental health once in the speech from the throne regarding our unhoused population. It's incredible. Because every one of us heard it at the door. Who, whoever set this up is, has made a, a, a gross error. Now we have to take extra time to, to make sure that this was an oversight, that, that you all, that this conservative government cares about people's mental health. And I know you do. I know, I know there's ministers, I know you care about that. So if you care about it, make sure it's in here. Make sure it's a vision for the next four years that's sustainable because pe if people's mental health aren't there, what can they do? What can they do? How can they get ahead? And you know, there was um, th there was stuff in the last one about about housing, and government continues to make investments in expanding and improving our social housing options. This is from the last speech from the, in both public and private domains. Our vacancy rate across PEI has gone from less than 1% to almost 3% in the last speech from the throne. This is what you wrote in the last speech from the throne. What happened since then? What happened since then? You dropped the ball. You dropped the ball because I remember hearing, I remember hearing, I remember hearing um, almost, in different standing committees, almost, let's take a wait and see approach. Well, COVID was there. I, I understood, like, w when we're sitting back, well, whoa, you know, like, uh, I don't know, this is something to hit it. Let's take a wait and see. We didn't know if we were going to be shut down for years. So the wait and see approach got you sleepy, got you sleepy. Because here it says we're almost at 3%. And it says a lot of it had to do with the pandemic. Fewer students and tourists that have reduced the pressure on housing in the province from the last speech from the throne. Which, which speech are you on now? The old one. The old one. Yeah, the old one. Thank you, Minister, for... for, for I seem to confuse you. A little bit of this. Can we maybe 3 keep it to this speech? <laughs> Honorable yeah. Member, have lots we, of time. Can we keep it to this speech? Yeah, can sure. Can we keep it to this speech? Sure. <laughs> We are at 0.8% now, 0.8%. And as much as, as, much as uh, a joke about uh, the clutches and gas and whatever else you want to joke about, I'm not, I'm not, I can't joke about this. I cannot joke about um, the, 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 the tribulations um, of, our, our, of our housing crisis and what renters have faced and the, some of the decisions that have been made. So the new speech from the throne, I thought there would be something in there about the rental situations that, that over the last six months, when the pressure got on, we have, we have, and this government has totally, totally lost the balance on this from landlords, renters, and I'm not talking about just the balance. When I'm walking in my district, 
um, during an election, and I run across I run across a mother who has a seven year old in a two bedroom apartment, and guess what? The the other son, who's 22 years old, 23 years old, and his girlfriend are in the driveway. Yeah, you've see, you've seen this. They're in the driveway in your communities, and you know what happened? He got evicted. He got evicted and doesn't have a choice and moves back in with his mom. It happened right there. She asked me to talk to the landlord. She asked me to do whatever I could. What could I do? What, what can I do in that situation? That happens to you. And it's happened to you. And if you were paying attention, which you were during the election, it is there. This is what we're talking about. This is what a 0.8% rental rate in Cross Prince Edward Island does. This is what happens, yes, when, when we are losing affordable housing units and, and you're heckling during those questions to the, minister, or to the member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. She is not wrong on her stats. She's not wrong because it's becoming unattainable and unaffordable at best across our province. And there's nothing in here that gives me confidence that we, we understand the issues. When I'm dealing with re rentals, rentals in large blocks, one day everything's fine, the next day they're facing 20% increases. Facing 20% increases just like that. Because of a loophole, because what you, you, didn't, you didn't take time to figure out that greater than allowable rental increases are open. Government of Prince Edward Island. This is hurting families. 20% rental increases. And that's, that's very, that's small in some ways. Because, like, the demand isn't there. And I understand from both sides what's happening. And the landlords are, just, are, are trying to react to, guess what? Bad policy, bad policy, reactive policy that, that, was un, that, that you didn't do the right work to make sure that our, our situation was taken care of for either landlords or tenants and you've lost the balance you have lost the balance and and this is affecting your constituents so if you are if you're a member watching from the side if you're if you're just if you're a, a private member you you need you need to take action on this and then that's just where the stress begins now they have to go through the iraq process have you filled out have you talked to them about a Form 10, 11, 12, 13? These are things that I don't want to know about, but I do. I know very well about them. And I want my constituents to know that I'm fighting for you. And I'll write a letter every time, because that's unbelievable and that's unacceptable. These are the things why I get upset about a speech from the throne and get a little bit worried about a speech from the throne that affects my constituents and my districts. So that's it. That's it for the old one. That's it for the old one. And kind of talking about the new one a little bit. Everything was fine in the speech from the throne until, until, you, uh, until the section where it says our plan, period. But you were right at the beginning. You were right at the beginning. Healthcare, housing, and affordability are in that top section in the speech from the throne. I was like, yeah, yeah, You're, those are three top, top concerns. Healthcare, we talked about it, we talked about it today. Healthcare is our top, the speech from the throne is down. You want me to vote on this after we, after we just shut down an ICU? I mean, I don't know how I'm gonna vote yes to this when it's your vision, and the first thing you do is you step us back in time to an area that we don't even know. We don't even understand. So healthcare, that's just one thing. ER closures constantly, like the member of the official opposition said, just tell us when it's open. I mean, that, can you imagine living in a community that, that that's what you're facing? And we're not, even in, we're not even in summer yet. There's a summer slowdown within the hospitals. It has to happen. Because guess what? We've taxed our doctors for so incredibly long to keep up during the winter months. And guess what? Our population gets ex exponentially big, bigger in the next little while. And guess what happens? They need to take a break too, a well-deserved break, because their mental health isn't great. And that's, that's just touching on healthcare. Housing, 
Um, Our shelter system, our shelter system is is not is is not bringing me confidence in, in housing at the moment for for some various reasons. We're we're not doing it. We we ignored we ignored it for too long. I, I say we too because I, I want to take responsibility for this too as an MLA. I didn't do my job to to keep government accountable. I, I mean, it, it, I, I that's why I get upset because if I'm doing my job. Per, Properly, I, I would have no. I'd have no questions. I, I would, we would have all worked together to get this done, and I, so we didn't. We didn't do do enough for housing in the in the shelter system, transitional housing system. We've lost units. We didn't understand what transitional housing was. Together, that is that is that is that is crucially important. Queen's Arms is one of them. Units lost because there was nobody there taking care of them. You know, we can't do this. Blooming House, Blooming House wasn't even there in 2018. It just started in 2019. It's full. It's full. They do an incredible work and, and they're there. Thank goodness they're there. What would have people done? What would people done if they're not there? What happens if they know that they're trying to get that one or two spots, or you're number ten on a list in Blooming House. What are you? What are you gonna? What are you gonna do? The, the, Bryn and Liz are talking about who are the who are the the co-founders of of uh, Blooming House, and they came and they said, "This is what we want to do. Uh, we're going to fill a gap." And the government at the time said, "Yes, okay, yes, let's do it." And then uh, funding was continued after that. And then they're talking about building another blooming house. Wouldn't it be nice for them to say in a proposal, listen, we want you to head up an organization that provides the next step to blooming house instead of going laterally. We provide the next step for blooming house so that we have nine beds here at blooming house and then we, we, we uh, call it bigger blooming house and have a transitional program up so that they can continue continuity, continue to provide the service. Instead of working laterally, let's move up. Let's give money to Blooming House so that it stays with them and they can provide transitional housing. They have the staff, yeah, they have the staff, the wherewithal, and that's what, that's what I would like to see in a housing program in a speech from the throne. That's what we need to do. Affordability, affordability, everybody is struggling. Fixed income. Has anybody gone around during the election and talked to people on fixed incomes? Okay, that's a difficult conversation to have in senior housing units where their fixed income is, is there, but everything around them has gone up. Okay, it's, 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 it's not easy, and they're scared, and they talk about it um, as being something that they're, 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 they're scared about, and, and that we have to do better for them. And I, and, I, and I really hope we will. I mean, the budget's coming down, and I'm excited about the finance minister to take the floor. And, and um, I, I know she's, you know what? To, she, she's done a great job of listening here um, to everything that's happened. And she, I don't think she, you've, you've missed much on the floor. So it's nice to know the finance minister has taken this all in and, and doing a great, because you, you, you have a very important role and something that you can push for for some of these things that are coming out. And I think it's, uh, you know, you, use your, new ministers, use your role. Use it, because islanders need it. I was listening upstairs. Oh, yeah? Okay, good. good. <laughs> uh, was anybody else throwing soft tomatoes at the screen? No? <laughs> you look great. <laughs> um, and, and, and something that uh, the Minister of Education has done, and here it's in our plan, expanding our early year sector. And your staff has, has done an amazing job. Like, uh, unbelievable, they, they're fantastic. And your staff and the, the association, and, and uh, this was great. I mean, a lot of the credit would have been, funding's an important, yeah, it's a compliment, yeah. It's, a lot of the funding ha ha uh, has come from a federal government program, which you've been, you've been there for, and you've been open about. Um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great value across party lines, and we're there. Um, and as much as I listened on the radio, to somebody from Ontario talk about childcare spaces this week in, uh, uh, on CBC, I, 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 just, I, I just disagree with, with that person. 
I want to see those numbers because I disagree because access to child care, access spaces is a major problem in Prince Edward Island, I, I believe. I, I, I don't, from tip, I don't tip. from tip to tip. It's it's the one thing um, that that's that's very, very scary in Prince Edward Island. So access is going to become crucial. Infant spaces, even more. Uh, I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough thing. But talking to talking to some uh, child care owners uh, facilities, they uh, I, I talked to them after the after that, then they just were laughing. They were like, people were calling them, parents were calling them after hearing the article, and getting mad at the child care owners because they're like, you have spaces, you have spaces. I just heard somebody on the radio talk about you have spaces and you won't let my child in. And then um, it was funny because the child care owner was like, what's your child's name? Look down the list and she's like, you're not on the list, but we'll put you down as 477. That's a true story. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. So it's, it's going to become, it, 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 it's, it's a pit in the bottom of our stomachs in here collectively about what we're going to do for our ch child care and our child care spaces. Keep investing. Keep, inve keep investing, yes. Keep growing it. Keep growing it. Good, good. Yeah, I'll clap to that. Keep blowing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. And I mean, I'll, 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 I'll agree that we need to keep growing, we need to keep expanding, and, and it, will be, it will be very, very important. But it's, it's, a, it's a daunting task, and we need to be there, and we need to act quickly, because it's, it's, um, it's very concerning in my district and others' ones, too. Um, patient medical homes and neighborhoods in, in, um, in 2021, which I made reference to today, because it's, it's in here, so it's, it's, it's in here. Um, by launching the patient, patient medical homes and medical neighborhood models, um, to date, you've launched a few. Um, my, my government uh, fully plans to implement 30 operational by the end of two, 2024. How many doctors will that be? How many nurses will that be? How many physios will that be? How many social workers will that be? How many, what, what, what's the scope of practice of the people that are in there? I don't know. I don't know. I still don't know how many work in a, uh, work in a patient medical home. I, I don't know what the makeup of each one is. Is it specific or is everyone individual? That's a, that's a lot. We want to see that happen. Will it solve the, the 30,000? Will everybody off the 30,000 patient registry be a, assigned to a medical home? I, 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 don't, I don't know. But it's, it's, very, it's very important. When the first time you didn't meet timelines, um, definitions, uh, it's hard to get information from it. And this is not an excuse that we stop family medicine practices. That's what I'm hearing at the door. Doctors want to train in the way they want to train. If they want to train in PEI, support them with the way that they want to train. Some of them say that, yes, I want to work in a medical home and neighborhood. Some of them want to do their own practices. So, I mean, it's varying. We have to be able to be there for what the doctor wants to best serve Islanders. Um, in, the, in, in one of the paragraphs, it talks about my government is making record investments in expanding our health human resource team. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, you can make record investments, but our population has grown. You have an increased tax base. The money is there to hire them. Ottawa just gave you almost a billion dollars over 10 years. Money's not an option. We need ideas out of this government. We need all, everything to do, to done to be able to say that it's not just about investment of money, we have to get people here. We gave you the permission to, to hire doctors hiring doctors. We debated that. That was supposed to solve the problems. I remember the, the, the fine minister uh, of health talking about that extensively, about doctors hiring doctors. We, 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 we watched that program and, uh, and it's, I don't know if it's working. We're, we're right there. We're, we're, I know that there's been some good successes. Um, but also, we're moving backwards because the data says that we have an aging, aging um, population of doctors. And we, we said that two and a half years ago. So we cannot keep our foot off the gas. And in this paragraph, hiring more nurses, more LPNs, more social workers, more allied health professionals, that's where it says. In there, it doesn't say doctors. I don't understand it. It doesn't say doctors, and it doesn't say physicians in this thing. It doesn't say it. 
I don't understand. In the speech from the throne, we just, so it's little oversights like this that, that, that give me concern because I've read through this a, a series of times. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. So this really should be a debate with all these questions that come out in here, but I hold the floor, so it's, let's do that. <laughs> um, additional, additional programs and services to reduce pressure in our emergency departments will also be in, uh, implemented, including reducing offload delays for ambulances. What? That's what's in the speech from the throne? Additional programs and services to reduce pressure in our ERs. I mean, I don't see them. I don't see, we're asking them, we're asking them uh, in the legislature, what was done before we lost ICU capacity? What was done today, Mr. Premier, what was done to help QEH after you knew you were gonna get six ICU patients transferred to the QEH, what was done I don't really know. I don't really know because they're they're telling me that their stress and their morale is low. So, and that's at our main hospital. That's at the one ICU department with eight beds. With eight beds, they got transferred six ICU patients. But in the speech from the throne, you 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 better follow this. That's what I'm saying. You better follow this government because if this doesn't happen, I don't know what the next stages are. Adding care providers and patient advocates to support patients in the waiting room. Adding care providers and patient advocates to support patients in the waiting room. How about we fix the ER system and get patients in and out and do better to make sure the service, we're adding a patient advocate in the, in the waiting room, which is probably pretty important um, because there's so many people in the waiting room. But is this not an omission of failure? from your government, that we're trying to take care of people in the waiting room, a patient advocate. What does a patient advocate in an emergency room do? What, 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 I want them in and out. If your mother gets sick, you do not want her to talk to the advocate. You want her in the emergency room with a doctor. You want to relieve the stress on the system at all access points so that your mother, your sister, your brother, anybody that needs service can get it. Please, please. And I like the physician assistants and nurse practitioners. I like that. I like, it's, it's good. It's the next line in here. I mean, that's, that's good. And we talked about, I mean, there were some great questions here um, uh, from, I think it was a Time Valley server. Great questions here on that, to have nurse practitioners um, in the emergency department, all hands on deck. So would you take a patient navigator in a weight room or a nurse practitioner in an emergency room? Uh, I mean, that's really, that's what I want to see. Well, we probably need both, but we, we have to do better with that. Emergency resident program to provide recent medical graduates looking at specialized in emergency medicine opportunity to complete the residency in our province. It sounds good. It sounds really good, and it is good, but we don't have the doctors to train them. We don't have, do you think a doctor right now can take on more patients with a, with a we need that residency program. It was there, the Liberals increased the capacity of it trying to keep, that was something that, the, that O'Leary and Vaness did when he was the minister. He did that, he did that, he knew the importance of it. Um, but, but right now, there, there, is, there is it, is it, can we handle that? We need it, we need them to train here, but, but wh where, are they, gonna, are they gonna train at Western Hospital? Or did they just come in on, on whenever it's open? We need to do a better job all around. That's why we need to keep our emergency rooms open. We need to keep our ICUs open. We need to have more doctors training here. Yes, indeed. But the services and the, the stress of, of operating in basically a, uh, a, a system that's overtaxed is going to have its effect. So there's questions there. Faculty of Medicine in Prince Edward Island? It's, you know, nobody can say, all you can do is at this point, kind of maybe just say, okay, it's been delayed once. They started, they started, um, they, they started on, on the building. It's, 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 uh, 
there's the internal conflicts already with that, potentially. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's, what's happening. Somebody wants to go in one direction, somebody wants to go in another direction. It, it is very, 20, 20 doctors coming, coming out, where are they going to train in Prince Edward Island? Is that 20 in addition to the six? Do we lose our seats in, at Dalhousie and Memorial well, when that happens? You know, like, um, maybe that would have been something that, and I'll say this for, um, I'll say this for uh, the great member from... Uh, you hate Rocky Point. No, no, not that one. Oh, <laughs> surely that's what you meant. I could say her name, I think. Michelle Beaton. Michelle Beaton yeah, constantly asked, uh, constantly asked, what did she ask about? She asked about a business plan, a business plan for the hospital, a business plan for the medical that's school. There's no business plan. There's no plan for the hospital. So we're all sitting here saying, we know we need to fix health care. Is this the solution? And then you have to say, you have to weigh, what did your constituents tell you? Because a period in the election, it was very, a lot of people were talking about it. A lot of people had different opinions on the medical school, and I have to listen to them. You can say it's a great, but you know, to have this at the start of a paragraph and say that this is the way out, um, it's, it's a long way from being the way we need to, we need to talk and debate about this. I want to be on board. I, I want to be on board, but I don't, I haven't seen the business plan. I haven't seen the business plan. Well, you can say it's negative. This is exactly what the constituents in my area talked about. If you, if you listen to them, this is what they talked about. And they're, they're, they're mixed and they don't know. Every, every, they don't know. They don't, they don't, nobody knows. And, and. But show us the business plan, make sure we're working together, and that Health PEI, Health PEI is not changing, Health PEI is not changing their tune from one day to the next. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. There's been conflict. In the standing committee, it's, it's, it's one thing. In the public, it was something else. I mean, it's, it's true. I've, we've got the transcripts. I don't know what direction we're going in. So for the government to take it, support it, do whatever you have to do to, do to get this going, but you need to show us the plans. And this cannot be another plan like uh, medical homes coming out, oh, we're going to meet with MLAs at 11 o'clock before the session sits one day, and here's the plan. Okay, this has to be a detailed plan because, yeah, it's, it, it, could mean, it could mean us succeeding in the future, but you, you have to weigh the risks on this too as well. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, uh, you, might, you can say it's negative or positive. I'm, I just told it to you like the, my constituents kind of told it to me. So the next paragraph I had, I had the word good, so I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep, I'm going to skip over that one. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> no, but there is some good things in here. There is some good. I don't know. Um, my, my, uh, lastly, but not least, my government will continue to make upstreams and in, upstream investments in Islanders to prevent illness, injury, chronic disease. Yeah, uh oh, is right. Yeah, uh oh. Is. No, and it's then that opens us up to talk about health prevention, health prevention, and health promotion. Health promotion budget that was cut, only nine thousand dollars spent in a health promotion budget over a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand dollar health promotion budget is not enough. Um, a confused government during a pandemic about health health promotion. It's, it, it, you were confused. You had no idea how to do health promotion, even videos. You had no idea how to get people healthy. You, 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 you didn't do anything. A wellness plan for four years. You had an opportunity to follow up a wellness plan. And because 2018, which I just picked up off the floor, yeah, because it's important to me. I carry it around everywhere I go. <laughs> that was what I did. No, no, no. No, that's good. Promote, promoting wellness, preserving health. Promoting wellness, preserving health. 2018, provincial action plan for seniors, near seniors, caregivers living on Prince Edward Island. And I, this is a wellness plan, and, I, and then I saw those things are important, but it, it just kind of touches on a few of the areas that were important. 2018, 
What do we have now? We have words and a document. We have no action for four years. And uh, Minister of Health and I had a lot of good conversations. The former Minister of Health and I had a lot of good conversations. I know that he believed in this. Um, just couldn't, couldn't get it to the starting line, let alone the finish line. Okay, we, we have to do more. People, some people might have laughed at me when I put in a Winter Wellness Day Act. <laughs> put it in. And guess what? Thought it would be easy to put in place. Easy. 20 minutes of, of activity. The, the, the member from Rustico Emerald talked about it. The first year, fantastic. I saw him on a sled going to Happy Winter Wellness Day. I remember that. It was amazing. It was, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was like, wow, they're embracing this. It's been downhill ever since. Yeah, it's been downhill ever since from that. Yeah. <laughs> And I want to thank the minister. The, the, minister, the current minister and I uh, have been to schools. We've trained over uh, 500 kids. And I think that, that, that opened your eyes. We went to Birchwood. Um, we, went to, we saw the kids having a good time. And it was very, very, um, very much a, a thing that was celebrated. See all those kids being active. And, and uh, it, 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 was, it was fantastic to have, to have you there and to, to have them in. And I, I think that we need, and, and you know, we've communicated whatever, but the department has to, has to, has to talk to the PSB a little bit more because I think that they're, they're might, they might be falling down on this. I'm trying to say it in a nice way. Get, you, don't just say Winter Wellness Day is here. I'm going to give you an extra 20 minutes of activity outside. Yeah. No, no. Of course. No, it's, I mean, uh, like, look, don't say I'm going to extend your recess an extra 20 minutes. Use the 20 minutes as just a guide. Kids' mental health and activity is falling to pieces across our country and in our province. And I, here's an opportunity where it says 20 minutes, but you can do an entire day of programming, healthy food, healthy snacks, whatever you want to do, but it needs, it needs the energy of a rust squirrel on a, on a sled. It needs that kind of energy and momentum. Yeah. Okay, it does, and I'm, uh, I mean, I, I look forward to the minister again. This year, Winter Wellness Day, guess what happened? It was delayed, it was, it was, it was uh, a snowstorm happened, boom, it was canceled, guess what? I never heard about it again. Well, I mean, it's just something very simple, but in here you say prevent, prevent illness, injury, and chronic disease, where does that start? How, do you, how are you supposed to start that? Education, start in the school system. It's right there. It's starting in the school system. We all want that to happen for our kids. And it's just, use it. Tell the PSB to use it. Let's get going. And that's why I, I want this section to become um, incredible. I want illness prevention. I want us to take proactive care of our health. And in order for us to do that, we need more than $100,000, $109,000 in the health promotion budget. Because it's, th it's this big, and I'll be watching that. You've got great staff over there. Um, we need a wellness strategy and plan. Not just a plan, it's got to be good. So that's what I'm looking for as, uh, in here. So I just I want to move on before I, before I stay on too much of that. <laughs> Um, but you, I'll, I'll talk more about it. For decades, our investment in critical infrastructure like housing have been chronically underfunded. We cannot continue on this path. Oh, you, 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 this government got a rude awakening when Fiona hit, didn't they? Yeah. They got hit from all over the place. And you know what? It was, it was a neglect of those facilities. And I'm not just saying it's you. It could have been, I wasn't there, but it could have been governments of the past too that maybe didn't invest enough in the time, but you know what? $800,000 for a repair budget for seniors housing is, was not good enough, was not good enough. And at the start of this session, I talked about a constituent, Lucy, and she said to me, and her question, I'll tell it to you now, what her question was, Minister of Housing. Her question was, the other day when I talked to her, Lucy said, tell them to fix senior, our seniors housing. That's what it was. And so I hope she's probably not watching. She's probably having a nap now with all this. But that's what her question, that's what her, that's what her question was. And she made perfect sense. And that wasn't it. I remember touring Rusco Emerald around in Huntington Avenue, Hunt Court. I toured him around with his staff. 
three years ago and said this was happening. Not only toured them around, but each and every person in there was able to fill out a form. And I said, I want you to write your concerns down. And I'm sure the minister probably still has it. That was an important day. That was an important day. And I'm glad the minister made time for that to come in to see what's happening in there. And these concerns were brought to this government at that time. And they continue to be. But then you have to fast forward to Hurricane Fiona when it hits for anything to kind of happen afterwards. Because you weren't ready. Those housing units weren't ready. 501 Queen needed the government. And the government was not there for 501 Queen. And that can never happen in our province again. Can't happen. If you went in there, we don't, we don't do that to Islanders. They were, water was streaming in the, 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 the fireplace. It was coming in from everywhere. Buckets were absolutely everywhere. There was no lights on. It was, the, 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 the smell two days later was, was, un, was unbelievable with, with water and, and moisture and, and, and people are running around. The only thing they had was themselves to hold on to. The only thing that was keeping them together was family and friends coming in to make sure they were okay. And I'm sure the, the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park and others can, can attest to this, but people were there, the community was there to, to make sure they got through it. But what I'm saying is government has increased their action and I wanna thank the minister for his housing staff who has allowed me to come in to the housing meetings to meet with meet when, when, you, when your great staff do come in. And they come in and they, they allow me to come in and meet there and, and stay and talk and listen on behalf of the residents. Things are moving forward. Things are moving forward. And there's greater investments. There's an RFP out for Huntington Avenue. I'm, I'm delighted about that. Um, but, but we will not keep our foot off the gas on there. And there'll be no in and out clutching on this. It's, it's, it's full out. It's full out because I never want them to see that again. And I'm, I'm sure, and I know the minister, and I know his staff are working very hard, but there is a lot to do. And now it becomes about prioritizing funding and making sure they're there. And I'm glad the minister has hired more staff. You probably might have to hire some more, um, but it's, it's something that we have an aging, an aging uh, 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 fleet of housing, and we, we, can, we can do better. Um, in here it says the word about housing immediate. What I talked to you about too, the commitment will initially focus on finding ways to immediately increase housing starts over the next 24 months. That's fine, you know, the last minister in here said, shovels in the ground basically in the spring. He said, quote, you will see a difference in the spring in Prince Edward Island with housing. I wanna know, that's why I said what projects was the former minister of housing, housing minister number three, how, what was he talking about? Because it's spring now and there, there might be projects going and I'm glad there are. And I could actually tell you which ones are going, but you know, I'll let you look it up. But I wanna say, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know. And the one on, the one on Beach Grove, and I wanna thank the, the, the housing minister number one, because there's four of them, so we'll just call them one. One, two, three, four. So as a minister number one. Remember you tried health critics? Yeah, no, I was there. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, what's that mean? You were health critic number three. I want to thank the minister. I want to thank the minister for we met on this project. We met on this project and got creative. And I want to thank the minister for that. You guys now have the health minister and premier. I remember the leaders said this housing project. <laughs> This housing project that we worked on Beach Grove Road is an important one to the community and it's, it's going. The problem with that is that the housing minister number one was just that, housing minister number one. We met on this project, that was four years ago. So when you see the road and the construction happening now, it took you four units, this is a 30 unit building. Every time the capital budget came and said 30 units in Charlottetown. Guess what that was? I have a feeling it was on Beach Grove Road that never got built till now. 
that in the capital budgets, in the future budget, has to be up around 180 to 280 housing unit starts. It's got to be increased. We can't wait four years. So I'm hoping your, 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 your committee, your cabinet committee, can do this. And that's just to play catch up. That's the magnitude of this. The former housing minister, housing minister number three, also said that he was going to see, he was going to see a vacancy rate of 4%. 4%. But in your, in your platform, guess what happened? And in this, it says 3%. So what is it? 3% or 4%? The last minister said 4%. Now we're back to 3%. Okay, I watched that stuff. Because that, that 1% in Prince Edward Island, it means a lot. So I'm watching this because it's at 0.8%. We're not even at 1%. So we have a lot of work to do. And my government will clear the housing registry by 2025. You have to build in order for, for you to do that. You have to build housing units. You can't go and spend your budget money that was supposed to be on builds and buy. That's an important part of it. But you can't spend the building money and say, oh, we're getting towards the end of a budget and go and buy something to spend it. And you know what else you can't do is that rental vouchers being given up, stop using the numbers in rental vouchers as builds. Stop using that as, stop using the rental voucher numbers because it's up there. I want to know builds. And you know why? In the last capital budget, it said you were going to build 100, 100 housing units. 100 housing units were going to get built. The guest was on the floor. Guess what? Three or four questions later, went down to 70, went down to 60, and then it ended up at 56. 56 units were built, and it was promised at 100. I have the, I have the data here. Do you want me to get it? No, I don't have time. <laughs> but I can, I, can justify, I can justify this. So it's just, I'm, I'm speaking passionately about it because this is the time to do it, because this is what Islanders need. This is what we need. We need to, to, to have a government that can move quickly on this, and your, your cabinet, your cabinet uh, as, much, as much as I enjoy the laughter and company of the Minister of Environment, I mean, it's, it's great to, to hang out with him and to learn from him. Every day I learn from him. But he should not, the Minister of Environment and Energy should not be on the Cabinet Committee on Housing. Where should I be? Well, that's a good question. Where should I be is the question. The Minister of Social Development needs to be on there because the clients that she represents need a voice. He cannot, the Minister of Environment has too much to do to be on the Cabinet Committee on Housing. We need the voices of the unhoused on there. You just split the department from housing into social development, that split, and then you don't invite social development on the Housing Committee. You, you have to hear that you have to hear those voices. Yeah, you, you have, but, I know, but you, you just put in here that you wanted a special committee on housing. It was that important to you, and then it was that important to you, and then you forget to put the Minister of Social Development on. And I have some issues, too, with the split, too, because this is my point, is that you split social development and housing, and you put housing with lands and communities, which is important, okay? But what happens, and I want to know that the, 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 that will not deter the people that need housing the most, our most vulnerable, our, our unhoused population, who are represented by the Minister of Social Development. So that's my concern, and I'm just laying it out there to you, and I'll be watching for that, okay? So that's, um, that's some of my, uh, my concerns. Hope you're enjoying yourself. Talk more about the environment. Talk more about the environment. Um, in here, a section on under our, our people. I don't get it. My government is committed to making life better for Islanders. This is important. As our population grows and diversifies, Along with it comes challenges. What? In the speech from the throne? This is what's in the speech from the throne? In the first line? Along with, with it comes challenges. Then the word but. 
So you talk about diversity. My government is committed to making life better for us. As our population grows and diversifies, along with it comes challenges. But, diversity, as, as, as an island diversified, it's not a problem. How we respond to the diversification of our pro province is the problem. How our government responds to that is the problem. How we didn't get our education system ready is the problem. How we have to do better with our health care system is our problem. It's not the diversity that's the problem. Because what this does is it pits, it pits, and I'll tell you, it pits, it pits immigration versus islanders right here. And that's what it does. And we don't need that. And you heard it at the doors. We don't, we need to stay together on this and language with but and challenges when you have diversity does not fit. So that's what I'm upset about the most in here. It's not easy, it's not easy um, for all those candidates who are diverse than ran. They ran, they, they, they did things. They would not, if they looked at this sentence, they would not be happy. And I think that I understand where this is going. And it's just words that you pick out when you see the world a little differently. It's just, these are things that you pick out. This was not written by, this was not written by, I don't know, somebody that, uh, that, that was trying to say, we're, our population is growing, we must embrace this. With equity, we must take care of Islanders. We must do whatever we can to build unison. And that's what I want to see in here. And that moves me. Our government will take new measures to support some of our most vulnerable, which will include a new centralized site with wraparound services for those experiencing homelessness. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we need a site. We need housing. We need them to, to ask to be able to get housing wherever they would like with support. You can't have a centralized site. There's data proven against this. There's, you have to look at the data about this. We cannot, people, people who are experienced housing, people who are experienced mental health and addiction cannot be put in one common area and think that we're going to allow them to, to, to be able to get out of that. That's why Deacon House was important because the services around Deacon House allowed people to leave that area, leave that area. It was out by the, the hospital um, when it was there. The, the building was the problem, not the service. The building was the problem. Fix the building. Don't tear down the building. Move it to Smith Lodge and then move them to Park Street. You've centralized the service and cross our fingers and hope for the best. We, we need to do better. That's what this section in this the centralized site with wraparound services, we, we need to be getting away from this. We need to do better with this. So that's just my view on it. After talking with people, um, everybody's at a different rate. So just keep that, keep that in mind about these are the challenges. Homelessness is people are battling something that is bigger than them, whether it be mental health, whether it be addictions, whether these, the, the, what is on the streets now is, is so powerful. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We can do better. We can do better with this, and I think we will. And just keep that in mind. Continue the conversations. I'd love to have the conversations with people. And, and bring in new ideas and, and make sure the communication piece is there when we get talking about this. The next section, when we talked about, in the last speech from the throne, we talked about micro grants. Everything was moving forward. We were, the, the investments was there. That was brought on, that was brought on after Black Lives Matter, where 10,000 people marched in the streets of Charlottetown. 10,000 people, anybody was welcome. They marched. They were there. They did that. And the, 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 it, the issues are there, but the support is not, is not the same. We need to continue to do that, both with the LGBTQ community, 
with uh, the issues that our trans community is facing, whether it be the BIPOC community. This section, this section is not, not good enough. With the population growth, our province has become more diverse, which has enriched our culture. And then it goes on to talk about this, this, this line, this is uh, everyone, no matter who they are, who they love, who they worship, what language they speak, or the color of their skin should always feel proud and comfortable to embrace who they are. You guys might clap to that, I don't clap to that. That's not great from my point of view. That's not great to have one section on diverse. We just move backwards. That's how I read that. You might, you might think, of course I have the ability to love who I am. It doesn't, the thing is I want to be treated equally. I want to have equity within our society. I want there to be a deputy minister of color in our province. I want there to be a minister of color in our province. I want there to be different things and opportunities there which can only be provided through equity because the way we change marginalization is we move them to the center. This has, doesn't have the word equity in it, doesn't have, doesn't have where we're going, and I don't know if this was screened through some of the people that sh it should have been screened to before it got written in here, because I don't think they would have used these same words. It is good, but it's not, don't, don't stand up here and say that we don't have problems, but we can fix them. We can fix them together if we work together. And this doesn't allow me, as a person of color in Prince Edward Island, to read these words, it means nothing to me. So I'm saying this, I'm saying this because I know that you care. I know every single one of you cares. But when you're the when you're when you're in a space that I don't know, when, when you when you're in a space, when I talk to the issues constantly about about people, they, they want they want to be put in a position where they're here. Just like those children we saw today. Those children we saw today, need, we're here. Let's make it as interesting as we can to, for them. I just went and brought them a, a, a speech from the throne book. That's all, that's all, to try to make it interesting for them. To try to make it fun and exciting. Let's bring people into that space. Let's have those conversations that are important. In a podcast recently, a person asked me, how do we fix racial issues in our community. How do we fix that in our community? How do we bridge those gaps in our community? I, I said to them, I said, we need to ask questions of somebody instead of just saying, oh, I, I love everybody. I love everybody. No, that's not me. You need to make time. You need to ask questions. And it's not where are you from, OK? It's, the, it's, it's, it's questions like, it's questions like things that get to know somebody. When you're going out for supper, what's your favorite meal? I don't know. I just made that up. Maybe I should have written something down. But it's things like that to ask how, and I said in the interview, I said, when I'm feeling down, what do I do? Who do I miss? Who, who do I love? and ask them questions instead of telling me that I'm, it doesn't matter who I love. Ask them. Get to know them. Stop with, with it's not the color that we see. It's not the person. It's not, the, it's not anything. It's just that, that person inside. When you ask them questions about who they are and, and, and it creates a conversation, you cannot feel, you cannot feel any different, you stop seeing things on the outside and you start to get to know the person on the inside. And that takes work. That takes work. And then it says, listen, I really enjoyed our conversation. You want to come over to our family's house for supper? Yeah. Well, that's how, it, that's how it rolls. Because you know what? I'm talking to a constituent in my writing, gets up in the morning, works from, uh, uh, works from uh, 7.30 till 4.00. Okay, he's been here for two years, 7.30 to 4. He gets done work at 4 o'clock. Guess what? He goes and works at Thai Express till 10.
He doesn't complain. And then he takes the money and sends it back to his family. That's, that's how we deal. That's how we bring closer people closer together. You have to put the time in. And these problems that we're having will go away. So on that note, Madam Speaker, I'd like to say uh, thanks for giving me your time. I know I, I spoke a little bit longer, but these are important issues, and I'd like to adjourn my portion of this. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could I have that, even though I don't have much time? Thank you. Um, can I set that up? Thanks, girl. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm happy to, to finally have the chance to speak. I have been adding to my notes for four days, and so what was, didn't plan on being very long. I'm going to do my best to get through this as quick as I can. I'd like to start by quoting a paragraph from the throne speech because I think it sets an important tone for the work of this government. And I quote, my government will have the energy to drive meaningful change and create a better society for all. This means having the courage to take bold actions and make difficult decisions. This means investing in our people, programs, and services. This means fostering innovation and creativity. This means challenging the status quo and always striving to be a leader in our great country. And most importantly, it means setting ambitious goals and working hard day in and day out to achieve them." End quote. It then goes on to talk about the fact that embarking on this journey requires building trust and respect and creating a culture of transparency and accountability. I could not agree more. The part I'm not so sure about is that government is ready for, sorry, the part I'm not sure, so sure government is up for or ready for is making bold decisions. In making bold decisions, you have to accept the fact and deal with the fact that your political base is not always going to support you. They're not always going to be happy with you. That's what being bold means. Being a bold, courageous leader means that sometimes you do things that don't make you all that popular, and you have to have the courage to do that. In order to attain this bold vision, um, you have to make decisions with no thought of how this will affect you politically. Historically, governments are very rarely as bold as laid out in a plan like this for that very reason. Rather, they use strong words like this to appease the more progressive of islanders without any sort of actual way to evaluate this boldness. I encourage you as a government to be bold. I support you 100% in being bold. I expect you to be bold. Most islanders do. I listened carefully to the Premier's latest speech from the throne the other day. And I must say, although there are some exciting snippets in there, once I dug deeper, it left me feeling uninspired. It lacks a full, well-rounded understanding of issues, ambition, and action on critical issues like healthcare, housing, the cost of living, and the environment. I saw the promise of boldness in one paragraph, but it's not laced throughout the throne speech like it needs to be. Like the rest of my colleagues here, I just spent four weeks talking to my constituents that were abundantly clear. They want action. No more talking, no more committees and reports that go nowhere, which historically in PEI we are famous for. When facing the truth that action needs to be taken, government turns to reports. Islanders want this government to do something to put a stop to the growing list of crises we face. Since getting elected in 2019, this Premier has ushered us through many crises that he had no control over. Hurricane Dorian, the COVID pandemic, and most re recently, Hurricane Fiona. But this Premier has also, uh, also ushered us into a few crises that he had direct control over and chose to sit on his hands and allow Islanders to continue suffering. We have a health care crisis. While it started under the previous government, 
This government seems hell-bent on fully destroying our public health system by not listening and responding to the voices of frontline health care professionals. On the topic of health care, there are a lot of pretty words and very long-term plans, but the throne speech fails to provide any concrete plans for addressing the pressing issues that Islanders face today. Access to timely medical care remains a significant challenge, a growing challenge for many Islanders. And as we know, that number continues to grow, especially for those living in rural and remote communities. We need a bold, comprehensive plan to improve health care services, not just a medical school that will graduate doctors in eight years and only add to the growing crises in health care at the moment. We need a plan that tells us if this is a good idea because we hear from an increasing amount of healthcare professionals who tell us this is not the way to go right now. We simply don't have the capacity. Yet, this government forges ahead despite the fact we have no data that tells us this is a good idea. Is that a responsible, bold government? I hope not. I expect better from a government. We are perfectly happy in here to make decisions without the, the data, and that is concerning. None of us in here should vote on something we don't have the information we need to make the decisions about, yet we do it. Every one of us in here, I, I encourage you to think about that. Reflect on what that means to yourself. Do you vote for things you feel you need more information on? The Premier congratulated himself on the success of the medical homes. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that this collaborative care model is fantastic and it is, it is absolutely the direction that we need to be headed in. It's just that these medical homes, in many cases, are nothing more than rebranded re critic clinics that already existed. No new clinics are being opened. The patient, patient registry continues to grow day by day. This is exhausting. I can't congratulate myself for running a marathon when really I just dropped across the street, which is what this sounds like to me. The other health care promises are largely incentives for recruitment and a little retention. There's no bold change here, there's no innovation, and unfortunately that's exactly what government needs to be in order to guide us out of this crisis. The experts, the ones that I consider experts anyway, maybe government doesn't, are those who are working on the front lines. Those within Health PEI who have told you repeatedly, again and again, we've lost two chairs of Health PEI over the same reason. They want you to get the politics out of health care. And they want you to sit, but, and indirectly, that will have an impact on giving autonomy to Health PEI to do their own hiring and retention. That's what they're asking for. We seem really challenged to find a good plan to recruit and retain healthcare professionals. When Health PEI tells us this is one way to do it, we ignore them. We, the Greens brought forward legislation to reverse that, and you voted no against it. Shame. The only surefire way to remove the politics is this legislative, the legislative changes to the Health Services Act. I don't see those on the order paper, Madam Speaker. More autonomy to health PEI would help in so many areas, and we know it. Where is the political will? The only thing that people can draw from this is that government is getting something from having their hands in the health cookie jar, obviously. Because it's not good for health care to keep your hands in there, but they're still in there. The hour has been called. Uh, with that, Madam Speaker, I will adjourn debate and seconded by the third leader of the third party. Thank you. Honorable Minister of... Is it you? Oh. Honorable Member for Moraldona. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move uh, seconded by the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture that this House adjourn until uh, May 23rd at 1 p.m. Shall it carry? Have a good weekend, everyone.